Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Rise of Drekus, Chapter 1. Maybe our final session. How are you doing, Faye? Um, yeah, doing, doing uh, pretty well. Mm -hmm. Giving Neil some shit for not realizing that I've cut my hair off, and we are like, this is the fifth episode, and he's a holy notice now. <laughs> But, um, yeah, pretty uh, excited to close out the chapter this time in a very nice and short four-hour session. Mm -hmm. Maximum. Yep. yep. Um, and we have some new stuff in the pipes as well coming up after that. So, fingers crossed that, you know, I don't get polar bear today. Yes. Um, yeah, but otherwise, really, really happy to uh, to finish this, however it's going to go down. How are you, Neil? Um... I'm surviving. It's been a busy oh, no. summer. I'm today's the last day of summer. Tomorrow is my last large obligation. And then life should just be easy for the rest of my mm. life. It'll just be fine and easy forever, right? Right? Yeah, it will be. Don't worry about it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. gonna be we're fine. Gonna, we're gonna do some really excellent map making. We've got Two new chapters of Rise of Drekus coming down the pipe pretty soon, which I'm very excited about. Uh, we'll talk about some of that a little bit later today. Um, Save or Die Outcasts had its premiere episode yesterday, which was super ultra fun and cool. Um, because it was a checked. live episode, right? So you can actually watch people on right. the table play. Right. That's pretty we cool. We recorded it a few weeks ago and it finally got broadcast after all sorts of technical problems. And, and now it's out and it's good. And um, <clears throat> so if you haven't watched any Save or Die stuff, now is a good time ooh. to start, I guess. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. I don't want to spill too many things, but you should definitely take a look at um, Pokemon Challenge's character. He's not from around here um, and he's adorable. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's all I'll say. All uh, right. <clears throat> so where last we left the party. Um, it wasn't looking too great. Uh, here is our, our the number of people we have left. And, um, there's, there's not a lot of them. If we see by the yellow HP bars and the, the red X's, uh, this little box right here is our team. And they're mostly dead. And uh, of the mm. sailors that, that survived, they're mostly dead. Only one, one hero made it. We do have a captive cleric and a surrendered spearman. And we have some enemies that have survived and fled. And as the, the battle is winding down and our heroes our, our detachment, our, our brave Drakissian soldiers go through the aftermath in the field. Um, I would like you to roll me a D8, Kelpentalin. One. And I would like you to also roll me a D4. Two. Okay. <laughs> What am I rolling for? Um, well, there's a lot of dead and dying people. Um, some of these people have been reduced to exactly zero HP and can be saved. Others are in the negatives, and by the time you get to them, they're too far gone, and you don't have the energy, and it's, you know, if you stabilize them, they'd be rolling d10s to see if they regain any HP, and they would just be slowly dying, and so they're, they're, they're not worth the effort. Um, but one of your own is within realm of saving that has been reduced to zero and is can be is stable and can be um, saved. And two of the enemy are savable, if you would like. Oh my goodness! So let's what? start. Let's start with the first one of <clears throat> yours that you come across. It mm -hmm. is. Where is my? 
It's one of your infantry spearmen. Mm -hmm. um, they're hovering at zero. They're in bad shape. If you and your archers want to take the time, they can probably be, what do you call it? Patched up well enough to maybe survive this whole thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's what, what we're going to do. We'll uh, uh, try to make a stretcher, put him on there and transport him back to one of the tents. Mm -hmm. And then um, I guess Willa is going to take care of him. Um, you know, with the others. We still have one, two, three, four healthy people, so we should be um, able to look after that person while the other people are trying to patch themselves up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it's it's while this person is being brought in on a stretcher to one of the tents that one of these nameless archers will come in and say to you, uh, Kelpentolin, we, we've got some survivors amongst the enemy. What what do you want done with them? Elaine pauses for a moment and she looks at the usher and she says, um, Will you point me to them so I can so I can have a look? Mm hmm. You'll be brought out to. Uh, I just forgot what I rolled on my d20. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Um, it is a, a pair of spearmen, one near the front gate um, and one sort of near the, the large fire that everyone was fighting around for a minute. The spearman over here, and the spearman over here. Mm -hmm. um, Regular Trachisian infantry soldiers, plucked from their farms or whatever they did beforehand. You know, they're not professional soldiers. They're they're levies that owe a certain amount of time to do their their work, a certain amount of time to their kingdom that they have to fulfill, and and they got the unfortunate position of being in under the command of someone who demanded that they betray the empire and now here they lie in the snow dying yeah probably like, not their fault you know they they're just following orders as best as they can but here they are i think it, it really shows that the people who are the lowest in rank and power are the ones who suffer the most right because um they didn't really have that much of a choice. Either they rebel against the people on this island who currently had the power in that situation, or they could have tried to starve together with the uh, people on the boat, right? But after seeing so many people die, it makes perfect sense to be like, well, if we're already here, you know, I might as well try and survive. But then if you change sides, that's a clear death sentence in Drakis, especially, I mean, at any time really but after war times you know you can't you can't have that like we can save as many of these people and then you know try to to plead for them or anything in front of the queen but elaine remembers that her orders were crystal clear there's zero there's absolutely no mercy there's no discussion um for uh deserters and if you want to be a good commander um, who's being respected for their work and who's being trusted with important things, then you need to make it very clear that you are very capable. And if you just bring back a handful of deserters who you are, who you know are definitely going to be executed anyways, and then you start like um, pleading their case, um, it also doesn't look very good for you if you're coming back mm. from an island full of deserters, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, um, it's a whole. It's a whole can of worms right there. So I think Elaine is going to send back, uh, send the soldier back towards the tent so she makes sure she's alone with those two um, is, well, out here in the snow. While Elaine is sending the soldier back and, and has her moment with these <clears throat> soldiers, these um, dying people, is there any thought that while certainly these people 
know, if you take them back, they're just going to get executed. Is there any value in returning them for public displays of what happens to traitors? Or is that not worth the effort? Or is that not the job? Um, um, well, it's not the job. First of all, there's no order that said bring them back for public display. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. And Elaine is a very order focused person. So if that would mm -hmm. be part of it, she might have considered it at least. Mm -hmm. But I think um, even though Elaine is a very these are deserters and these need to, people need to die and I have my orders and clear instructions person um, she's not cruel in nature you mm -hmm. know like she thinks that people can make mistakes and they can be horrible mistakes and these mistakes need to be punished but that doesn't mean that you need to hang out your corpse open for everybody to see or you need to be publicly tortured. I mean, we've seen it right. before. Um, there was a chance to put like people's heads on spikes and things like that, mm -hmm. which is not, it sounds very cruel, but it's not unheard of at mm -hmm. all, you know? Um, and if um, if you would walk through through our Drekkis and if you would find, for example, like a, a tribe of slaughtered goblins or something you might find like heads on spikes you know for deterrence out there that's like a not a particularly wild thing to do but mm -hmm. elaine doesn't appreciate that very much and if it's not asked of her she doesn't have the idea to do that herself what about um, um, information could anyone here be be used by the empire for something they might know is there value in bringing them back alive mm -hmm. just to for interrogation purposes? Hmm. That is Maybe a possibility, not. but I guess the the most important person to interrogate is the cleric, who is the yeah. person we also do have. Um, mm -hmm. And whoever... Whoever you bring back is going to be a liability on the boat trip. Mm -hmm. You know, you always have to keep in mind we are currently... Um, if we get ambushed a second time when the boat comes or, you know, like at, at any point, really, it's going to cause us a lot of trouble. And at some point you have to figure out how much information do we need and how much trouble is that information worth. And I do not have the feeling that from the people we've interrogated so far, that a simple foot soldier has pertinent information that is going to turn this whole thing upside down. Mm hmm. Like the only person, other person would be interest, uh, interesting to interrogate would be the other Kale Goblin Stompen. Mm -hmm. But right now, as is, we do have one more foot soldier we can ask questions. Um, okay. But there also does need to be prolonged suffering here, I don't think. Okay. Yeah. Well, the other archers are all. You know, they're taking rests where they can. Some of them are sitting in tents. A couple of them have gone back to stand watch, uh, mm. exhausted, but knowing that you can't just... They, they might have fled, but they could come back at any moment. They could just regroup, regain their bravery, and attack the camp if the camp's some um, defenses are down. So you have two archers on watch, some resting, some with... The... <clears throat> some watching the one prisoner. Some taking care of the one um, dying, but savable Dracissian soldier. And, and I think we also need to start burying some of those corpses because we're out here in the wilderness, right? And this is like a slaughterhouse. There are so many dead people here that I am a little bit worried about attracting, you mm. know, visitors. Uh, yeah. So we might have to, to bury a few people in, in the snow, shovel some snow on all the blood that's all around here. Things like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But like for those for those two soldiers, I think um Elaine just sits down and has a long look at them. You know, at the simple man who have chosen to die this way I guess on that day and um, she doesn't decapitate them or anything but she does have her she does have a dagger um, with her and she 
make sure to make it as quick and I guess not gruesome as possible mm -hmm. yeah nothing dishonorable no hacking to bits no no throwing the heads around but just a a fast merciful yeah. ending okay well I think mm. the rest of your day will be spent mixed between rest and moving the bodies around mm -hmm. and there's a lot Can of that Mm -hmm. What happens with my armor and shield? Because um, I had to take that off due to um, yeah. the heat armor stuff. Well, it sits in the snow, so it's not going to deform or burn or warp or anything like that. It'll be fine. The plate mail has been sort of, you know, the straps have been cut to make it come off easily. And it will need to be repaired before you can wear it again. Uh, there's chain mail lying around that you could put on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, I'm putting my chainmail back on then, I guess. And what about the shield, though? The shield is fine. You can just pick okay. up the shield and okay. and uh, wear it. Yep. <clears throat> All right. Well, um, the rest of the day is going to pass pretty easily. Well, or it'll be a hard day, but it'll pass without any more dangers. What day are we on now, Neil? That was day 16. Um, and I'm just going to make a bunch of dice rolls right now. Right. So the next day, there hasn't been any attacks. There's been no monsters. It's another calm, cold, but not windy, not blizzarding day out here in the Talons on Arrow Island. I think I would have taken the time to interrogate that soldier who's still alive. Ah. That spearman. Yeah. Well, they are alive. They are uh, bound, They're tied up. They've had their weapons and armor stripped from them. Um, and unless you've explicitly given them orders, they, they're a little hungry. Actually, they're, they're very hungry and quite thirsty. Yeah, I will, I will take a ration and some, uh, like a water skin over to them. Somewhere in a tent, I guess. I'm going to ask to question them. Mm -hmm. And I'll... Um have uh, a spearman stand guard at the at the entrance to the tent and i'll hand him some I'll hand him a ration and some water because um even if they are deserter you know they did surrender so mm -hmm. they deserve at least some acceptance in that form mm -hmm. i'll say what's your name soldier uh osmi <clears throat> Osmi, tell me what happened from your point of view with this whole messy situation. I got called up maybe four months ago uh, from my village just outside of Stoneport. But it used to be Stoneport. And um, <clears throat> we we drilled in um, a, a training camp near Solwick for a while, um, and then we I, I was to serve under um, the the Kel Heidi Siki, and after she drilled us and trained us. Um, a couple of people from my village, actually. We we got the mercenaries. Um, they showed up. 
Uh, and we all worked together for maybe a week or so, getting to know one another. M most of them didn't really speak the common tongue. Um, but, you know, some grunts and some words exchanged here and there, and we, we could more or less get by. A couple of them learned the language, or, or knew it, it knew it well enough. And then maybe two, two months or so ago, we got on a boat, a ship, um, when we were going to head to Whiteshore and re replace the people there who had been trying to dislodge goblins in, in the woods just south of the, the Shadow Mountains. Um, apparently they've been having a hard time. This, this, right, we're the third? We think we were supposed to be the third group to, to go in there and, and work the problem. Um, apparently the area is full of traps and, and um, you know, avalanches and spike pits and there's some sort of goblin leader there that's particularly um, you know, harder to get rid of. Mm -hmm. um, the, the company that we were supposed to be replacing suffered some unfortunate, some, some pretty bad... It sounded like they, a lot of them had been pretty badly injured by goblin traps and uh, hadn't gone so well. Um... So we were going in with, with the, the goblin stomping twins to clean up the situation. Uh, but, you know, we're hanging out on the boat. The mercenaries are keeping to themselves. The, the officers are keeping to themselves. The, the sailors are pretty friendly, but, you know, they're working and it's just us. Just us. Poor, poor blokes hanging out below decks most of the time. Getting some fresh air when we could. Um, and then, you know, we, we could overhear the cleric arguing with the, the officers. Um, there's some pretty heated exchanges and debates in the first day or two. Um... Tell Heidi Siki came over to us, to, to our, our platoon at some point, and told us that there was a there was a big problem. The cleric had seen some things um, and had made some prayers to the gods that had been answered. It soldier looks at you for a moment and then decides it seems like they're going to ask you a question and then they stop and shake it off and continue <clears throat> okay I'll say well no what is it am I going to make it home what do you want to do home I want to go back to my farm. They did explain to you what your job is when you signed up for this, didn't they? Yeah, it was to... It, it was to follow the orders of the knights and and get rid of all the the goblins and and hold the forests until someone came to replace us in three months or so but you didn't do that did you i followed the orders of the knights <clears throat> Kel kelsiki came to us and said that there was a problem um uh, that the cleric that Mother Ilsa had gained some unsettling information that they'd been arguing about. Um, apparently the this, this goblin forest is a bit of a meat grinder, more so than 
anyone was expecting. Um, and that people were just being... The goblin woods were being used as a way of disposing of folks the kingdom didn't want to keep around anymore. And do you really believe that? I didn't. Not at first. And we all sort of, you know, no one really believed the knight, but, you know, she's a knight. She's an honorable person. She's not going to lie to us. But maybe the cleric was wrong. I mean, she's a cleric of Mathis and Zafia, goddess of knowledge and wisdom. And if cleric of knowledge comes to you and says, hey, I, I know this thing. I mean, how do you how to refute that? Um, I say, um, um, can I ask, did you ever have the feeling that this cleric had some influence or power over the Kells? That they might have used their divine powers to influence them beyond just words, you know? I, I've never thought about that, to be honest. I know they were arguing a lot in the first couple days on the boat, on the ship. Uh, but then they all sort of fell in line somewhere on like the, I don't know, third day or something. <clears throat> if you have irrefutable proof, do you really need three days to convince somebody if you can just show them? You know, they they didn't tell us. They didn't come to us and say, you know, here's irrefutable proof of what happened. But Kel Heidi Siki did come to us and say that this is this whole thing is scuffed. That the cleric is pretty certain the queen is in league with some sort of extra planar demonic forces, and that these goblin woods were being used as a disposal ground for... You know, we, we started talking amongst ourselves, and a lot of us, we, we have we've had some problems. You know, I... I'm no saint. I... During the war, I stored some some, you know, a bunch of sheafs of grain, tucked them away for a rainy day. A whole bunch of us did, you know, our, our whole farm, you know, the dragon was burning things to the ground. Uh, so we, we took a half a harvest, claimed that it had been destroyed by the dragon, tucked it away for a rainy day, got found out, pressed into service later for it. So when the knight comes and says to us that you know, our lot is to be goblin fodder, that we're just being thrown into a mess that doesn't need to be done that way because of our past actions, it, it made some amount of sense. I could imagine, you know, the knights being done the same with. Um, and if you're going to just throw people into to goblin fodder, why would you pay mercenaries? But then the mercenary said they, they don't get paid until the job's done. And um, and that doesn't sound that much like a meat grinder to me then. Why would they be interested in sending mercenaries into a place where that's just there to punish people? Doesn't make much sense to me. But you know, I mean, I'm sure they want the goblins gone too, but they're just taking the they're, you know, it's it's a lot different here in the cold, in the snow than it was on the boats that day, where everyone's exchanging stories and histories, and you know, there's a, a cleric there with the word of God telling you that your your queen, your empress, is uh, you know, under the influence of demonic forces and that the leadership has been corrupted. Um, and I guess that is also easier to believe when you're already angry for being pulled away from your farm and put on a boat, isn't it? 
and scared. You know, I I've never I've never killed a a person, never fought in a a battle before. I and you know, there's some weird things that happened during that war. I've heard stories. I've heard all sorts of stories about, you know, uh, uh, necromancers with undead armies and dragons with steel skin that you know, changes colors and you know, monsters appearing out of nowhere and invisible uh, assassins and invisible soldiers uh, setting upon towns and villages. Um, the, yeah. You know, the, something about small winged monsters flying around castles and keeps and dragon slayers that are you know, here one minute and then gone the next and saving people and then disappeared for years and uh, there was a lot going on a lot of a lot of really wild things happening during that time mm. and the queen and all of that consorting with demons to overthrow the great red dragon you know that's I mean, how do you think they killed Scoria you really think that was just the 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 disgraced and resigned former queen's you know not quite bastard offspring but certainly not the greatest family that we've ever seen just three drunken misfit mm -hmm. brothers managing to 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 kill a red dragon on their own come on now whenever he says like the bastard you know the bastard family I lean in slightly closer, you know, and I just remember that if you are some form of bastard, some form of person who should not be in the position they are, then the simple, even the simple folk is going to look down mm -hmm. on you, mm -hmm. right? And I it might not, not have been the smartest comment this man has <laughs> made on this island so far, but like, Elaine is, is listening and she hears a lot of the common people talk about things, right? A lot of rumors and a lot of talk that is kind of dangerous for a country that has just succeeded in fighting that, winning that war. Um, and rumors that can at some point even start a revolution or some mm. sort of um, disruption, I guess, in, in the simple folk. So she can recognize that there are rumors and talks, and these are amplified by people from miserable situations being put into um, stressful situations where they have to prove themselves and then they crumble under the pressure um, because it's easier to believe rumors and it's easier to not accept um, responsibility for what you have done, even though you knew what the rules were. I mean, this man knew that storing away grain is a bad thing that is needed to fill like the bellies of soldiers to fight for your kingdom, to ensure that you don't fall to a red dragon. Mm -hmm. um, and. He's doing the, oh, everybody did it. You know, it's not, it's not my fault. Everybody, we all did it. It's a perfectly normal. Sure, mm -hmm. like, you know, we, mm -hmm. we understand that. That is all understood. But once again, the big question is always, if we all act that way, what happens to us, right? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, if we all, ha like, if we all do these things, then we will fall as an empire. Yeah? So if everybody just, you know, if everybody is a little bit more selfish, it means a, a great detriment um, to us. Which doesn't mean it's not understandable, but it's it's a problem, and it's a problem that creeps through the military ranks and through the farmers and everybody else. So she's not particularly surprised, but yeah, yeah, yep. It's a little bit, it's a little bit worrying. So she'll look at him and she'll say, um. What was day-to-day -day like after you left the the ship here? 
After you crashed and left the sailors behind, what then? Well, at that point, we really searched the island for a spot. <clears throat> the Mother Elise said that she would make her prayers for a ship to come and get us. And so we should stay on the far side of the island. Um, and we made our way there. We, we hauled our gear through the snow. The first few days were, were kind of tough. Um, the, the skiff that we used to get off the, the crashed ship onto the mainland at some point turned over and, and sank. We couldn't get any more supplies off the boat. Um, but we, we managed to haul everything we could into a... Um, I don't know, it's like a like a canyon that's been frozen over on top. It wasn't wasn't too cold in there. Um, it actually wasn't, you know, considering the surroundings, it, it really wasn't that bad. Uh, I don't know if there's like, you know, the, the ground was sort of, well, it wasn't warm, but it wasn't frozen in that cave. But the, you know, with the, the ice on top and the temperatures in there with the little fire were actually pretty tolerable. Um, and we took that as a sign that Mother at least knew what she was doing and that she'd brought us to a, a safe, warm place far from prying eyes. Um, what you know? prying eyes? There was nobody supposed to be on this island. Yeah, but if, if someone came by, you know, if a, a ship floated by on the north side, we didn't want anyone to... She, she had us go to the top of the mountain and find one of the old mines there and unbury it. It had been, you know, sort of blocked by debris. Um, and put a big bonfire there so that any any ships in the South Sea might see us. Uh, and, that, you know, no, no one goes in that South Sea area. There, there's not much... There's no reason to head out there um, unless you're getting blown off course coming from Solemn, which happens. Uh, and so we, you know put a big fire up on the mountain facing out to sea hoping that one of these ships would get blown off course and, and come by to see us um cleric said that that she was asking the gods to do just that just to, to blow a ship off course and come find us and we settled down we, we hunted you know some seals and walruses that we could find and Picked at things, little bits that we could find throughout the the island. Um, kept away from the monsters. You know they're they're dangerous, but they're not entirely stupid. A little hedgehog of spears will will keep a polar bear away after the first strike or two. And the, you know those other things. Have you have you seen the big things out there? The tall the bipeds. He nods. Yeah, there's there's a few of them out there. I don't know where they come from. I don't know where they go. We, we tried to follow their tracks, and they just they just stopped and disappeared at some points. Um, but you uh, were starving when I found you. Yeah. How great have these effort been to hunt down, you know, prey and seals and whatever? I mean, I mean, we, you were in rough shape when you came here. Yeah. Yeah. The. The knights told us that there's only so much food and that we should all be on half rations until a ship comes because it could take a while. And so while we, you know, we, we stored food and we, we got, we, we got some seals and a walrus or two and um, a couple of fish that came too close to shore. And most of it's just packed away in the cave. Um, with a guard posted on it the whole time make sure that no one sneaks in and gets to it because they were worried that your own people were going to eat the rations when they were hungry well, yeah right? yeah yeah but so we... you still have rations in that cave mm-hmm how many you think for how many days probably like a Two or three hundred pounds of food. Two to three hundred pounds of food. That's a lot of food to let people starve that badly. Well, you know, a pound of food a person a day, something like 
23 24 people that's not that's not that many days um so some of us have been even doing you know quarter rations um the knights you know have been only doing quarter rations this whole time mercenaries have been doing half rations And it's always fresh, you know, we, we have a cleric. She's got purify food and drink. And she can create water. So there's always fresh water, no matter what. And there's, you know, hopes for more creatures. But, you know, we scared off most of the seals, but we, we had some traps set for if they came back. And then it was just, you know, waiting. Um, sending rotations up to the mountain, which is a lot colder and less forgiving. and Keeping that fire burning all day, all night. And um, waiting for a ship Because you have people like come. us would see the light and come to the mountain. And then what was the plan exactly if the ship came? Well, if a ship came from the South Seas, uh, we, we'd use some of our clothes that we still had and wave a, a brightly colored flag and signal that we needed help. Um, and then they would, I mean, they'd be, be sent by the gods. They'd be here to help us. All we had to do was attract their attention. And then you would nicely ask them if all of you could come aboard. He shrugs. I, it's not my job. I'm, that's, that, you gotta talk to the knights. You have to talk to the cleric. I, I don't know. Do your people know exactly what the plan is? Well, I mean, if my plan was to get, go against all the orders I have received, right? Then I think these people should know what the plan is. Because that's not the plan they were supposed to carry out. You know what your plan was? Your plan was to go to that island and to fight goblins. And then you did not follow that plan. And it's always easy to say we did it because the Kel said so. But you knew that you were never supposed to leave that boat, didn't you? I. It all made sense. You know... The, the queen's nephews, all that, you know, turning from, from the laughing stock of the kingdom into, to, you know, epic dragon slaying warriors in just a few years with, with, without the aid of, you know, extra planar monsters I, I didn't believe it they they got a, a gold dragon with red scales to fight with them uh, it there's something there's something unnatural happening within Drekus. I'm sure of it the, the cleric is sure of it the knights are sure of it can I ask if you have the choice between that being the case and Scoria the Red burning down Rickthon Varenta, taking your fields, taking your corn, burning down everything you loved. Which one would you have chosen? But Scoria has been there for generations without doing that. We provoked her by invading Mystria. And even if, even if, even if she was going to do this anyway, just because, you know, the queen, I don't, the empress, I don't know what she did, but if she's had to become a terrible monster in order to fight these monsters, doesn't that mean it's, it's our, she should be next? You know, just because that she might have helped us now doesn't mean that she is on our side. If she's consorting with, with with demonic forces, you know, the same demons that overran Eridon that, that destroyed that entire kingdom and started all of this war, if she's in league with the things that began the war, 
she it's it's not gonna end well for us someone needs to to stop her or at least you know make sure everyone is aware that you can you can kind of like see you're not buying this like you, you're not <laughs> these words no, are not I'm landing just, on you i'm just i'm just looking at him and i'm the problem i'll just look at it and i'll say um I don't know how you thought all this was going to play out for you. You know, I'm sure if you would have been with my people, if you would have been to this island, uh, like sent here with me to take care of the deserters, because you had to repent for taking all that grain back then, you would have been sitting out here with me on my campfire this evening. Because that would have made sense to you then. But why would the cleric lie? She's she's a cleric of Mathis, god of knowledge. And that why? means they can't make mistakes. That means they can't be hungry for power. That means they can't be selfish. That means they can't charm people into following them. Is that how you perceive clerics? Maybe she did charm us. What if I'm under the effect of a charm person spell right now? Well, unfortunately, that's not my problem because I'm not a wizard. I'm just a fighter. I'll pet his shoulder and I'll leave him with the with the guard for now yeah. and I'll leave him to eat his ration. Yeah, he'll he'll raise his eyes up to you. This whole time, you know, he's not been looking at he's been sort of looking mm -hmm. towards the ground as I have been sort of like down and away telling the story as if as if talking to himself, aware that you're in the room and, you know, conversing with you, but also like not not excited to meet your gaze. Um, but when you Elaine stand up will, and, and will pat look a shoulder. Straight, straight in the face when uh, she gets up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey. She understands. She's entirely aware. It's not like she doesn't understand what is going on in that person. But the second you take a military rank and you're responsible for people mm -hmm. in this army and for the safety of that empire you have to think um on a different scale and she he, like when he says these it doesn't even it doesn't the funny thing is it doesn't matter if it's true or not you know it mm. doesn't matter because what is what's the goal the goal is to keep people safe right and how mm -hmm. do you achieve that? Not by following whatever these people are following. And of course, could they have all been charmed by the cleric? Of course, it's an entire possibility. It's an, it's entirely possible. But what are we going to do? Just fetch every single person in the entire country who's ever done some wrong and check them for magic? You know, it's, it's just not something that is happening. Yeah. It's just, and especially if you're a poor bloke farmer who's been pulled into service, like it's it's not happening. Mm -hmm. He meets your gaze. His eyes are are sad and big. You can see the tears beginning to well up on in the lower lids. Um, and I, he doesn't even. He doesn't say the words that are so clearly present on his face. I think he can tell by the stern, stoic, somewhat grim expression on your face that what he's what he's asking you with his eyes is not is not going to happen. Um, so he, after a few seconds, looks away again, and with his foot sort of kicks at the the ice and snow underneath the cot he's sitting on. Yeah. 
and I will leave him there for then. I'm going to check on the cleric how she is. She's going to... How does that work? She will regain one HP in one day. So when does she wake back mm -hmm. up? 24 hours. All right. Probably tomorrow morning-ish, you know? 24 hours is like a soft time. Mm. I'm thinking about these people out there. You know, all the hurt other soldiers. So there's currently just the Solomies left with the one kale goblin stomping. Mm hmm. And I'm. Elaine is very curious to see how that plays out because allegiance is a very difficult thing for these people now. We've seen the other Solomies person cut down another um, soldier of Drekis to be able to surrender. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very clear that whatever Mother Ailsa's plan was has not worked very well and they've lost many, many people. So there is a certain doubt in leadership established. You know, mm -hmm. at least that's that's how Elaine sees it. So she's very uh, curious how that would play out in their part. But, you know, it's not like she can scry. Um, so she doesn't have any means to figure out that information. Mm -hmm. We do have a lot of gear in the camp, though, now. Lots of gear lying around. So we will try to, before we, like, you know, put all the corpses under the snow, I think we will try to bring back as much salvageable gear as we possibly can for the war efforts. The mm -hmm. re repair efforts, the building the empire efforts, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Well, you can stack gear, you can move bodies, and there's just going to be a lot of waiting, I think, unless you're going to march out tomorrow morning um, and hunt these other people down. No, I don't think we'll hunt them down just yet. We're all pretty hurt, and they are very much hurt as well. Mm hmm. So I don't think there's there's a need for that. Okay. Well, why don't we cut to our first break? And when we come back from our first break, we will see what Kel Pentelin is going to do about these five remaining folks. At least five. You know, maybe there's still someone guarding the rations back in their camp. Maybe, maybe there's still <laughs> someone up on the mountain. Maybe there's a few more um, scattered about. We'll see. Yeah, we'll... maybe some fled that camp and have actually abandoned them and nobody told me they're actually good guys. Yeah. I'm down. I'm ready. If you want to talk, you know, I'm ready. We'll find out on the other side. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Rise of Drekus. So, you leave this Osmi? Osmi? You leave Osmi in the tent you step outside back into the cold into the you know the, the gentle winds and you can see the look on the soldier's face who was standing outside of the tent guarding it and you can tell that they've overheard every word that was said in there obviously you know it's not a it's not a big space they're right there and there's nothing else to listen to i will reassuringly pat him on the shoulder as i walk past you know uh, yep. I have to be the I have to be the one leader people can trust on this island or I'm going to be in trouble myself you know I think Elaine made sure throughout the entirety of the campaign that when she put herself at risk and when she decided to take on the missions it wasn't just purely to prove herself but it was also to establish trust of her soldiers in her and in her like leadership Mm -hmm. Right, because she knows if you're in a situation with deserters, the last thing you want to have is your people turning against you, right? Mm -hmm. And, and um, deserters always sow some sort of doubt in people, and they're like, "Oh, that kind of makes sense, right?" Because it kind of does. It kind of does make sense. <laughs> so you want to prevent that by making sure you're the person they're following. You keep them mm -hmm. well fed. You keep them as safe as you can. I mean, we've just had an onslaught, so you want to take that with a grain of salt, but. Um, early on, you really want to establish, yeah. I'm here for you people, you people follow me, we're a team, we're looking out for each other. So, yeah. you know, she'll give him a pat on the shoulder and a nod and walk past. All right. Did you want to talk to the cleric? 
the next day. Oh, am I ready, Neil? Am I ready? So what's very important to me, what I would like to establish, is this cleric never has a single hand free. If she ever eats anything, it's going to be fed to her by somebody. Willa and I both have rope use proficiency, so we both check her like hands and make sure these are tied um, like several times throughout the day. Um, and only as you're, when as we... you're discussing this policy with Willa, mm-hmm. uh, she she would like to just offer you a suggestion. Um, you don't have to take it. But I will listen to her suggestion because I respect her opinion. Yes, Neil. What if is If you just suggestion? take the fingers off her hand, she can't make any somatic gestures or use any material components. Or if you just take the whole hand, um, you know, how's she going to cast a spell? The hand might, you know, um, she might bleed to death that way. Fingers, you could probably pop off the fingers and with the snow around prevent her from bleeding to death. It would prevent her from being able to cast anything. That is true, but if we really wanted her to, if she was to be interrogated later in the city and we wanted her Mm. to show something that she has done, Mm. I'm not an expert on clerical magic, well, I don't know if you noticed, but my connection to to the gods in this uh, very forsaken, frozen (laughs) wasteland is uh, pretty minimal, so I'm not an expert on how clerical magic, magic works. But maybe it could be useful for her still being able to use some of these things later. But it's also a great danger we put ourselves in. I do acknowledge that. Not a big fan, but also not a torturer, you know. Okay. Appreciate you thinking ahead, though. Ah, well, uh, one thing. I'll look at her. I'll say, can you stand up straight for a moment? She does. I'll... I'll I'll have a look at her. Willa has like six charisma if I remember correctly. <laughs> Let's have a look real quick. Yeah. Uh, is it six? She has six charisma, so I'll look at her with her shoulder strain and I said, um Willa, whenever we're going to debrief this mission, and I'll have to report in to uh Richard. I would like you to come with me. Okay. You would need to make sure you have the right posture. Not talk when you're not spoken to. And you would need to show a great respect to these people. Because you do not only represent yourself. To some yourself, merchant you also... who became a lord? She says with her five wisdom and six charisma. I'll grab her, I'll grab her by the collar, right? And I'll pull her a little bit closer. And you have to keep in mind, these officers are more simple people, right? They're not nobles or anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I will look her straight in the eyes and I'll say, Willa, are you a person who appreciates opportunity or would you like to just follow around through the snow forever? Oh, I get you. I... I can keep my mouth shut. Sometimes standing up straight and speaking only when we're spoken to is better than a bow to show respect. If you can keep it together, I will reward your loyalty and we're going to achieve what you are here for. But I need to be able to count on you. I'm not going to take you with me if you embarrass me. Aye, aye, sir. Kel Pentelin. And I'll give her a, a, a clap on the shoulder. Because um, it's always a risk to bring a commoner with you as a noble. But on the other hand, Willa has done a great deal for her company. And Elaine does need her to keep the troops together. So, mm-hmm. you know, this is a, a good moment to, to show her you're the last of my officers. I count on you and one hand washes the other. I will take care of you if we make it out of your life. Excellent. Okay. <clears throat> well, we can skip a day while you wait for the cleric to heal. 
um, and all the. I take it the the guards haven't spotted anything throughout the day. No. No giant polar bear coming in for a little snack or something. Okay. Nope. Good. Nope. And I'm gonna restore one HP to all of your people for one day of rest. Am I going um, to restore my own HP? 14. I have already Let's added go. it to you. Damn it. Shit. Yep. All right. Well, the next. Well, not the next day. It'll be day 18 is when you talk to Mother Ilse. She needs to rest all day 18. Uh, day 17, day 18 is when it all comes round. <clears throat> no one's been spotted. No signs of monsters, no signs of polar bears, no signs of deserters. Just sort of the, the gentle weather. Chilly, but not blustery. Um, pretty quiet in camp. Bodies have been dragged off tucked away in little snowy chambers outside of the camp. Gear has been piled up. There's more than enough room in the tents for everyone, right? We've got oh. six tents and three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen people if we include the two prisoners. Um, so, you know, cozy, cozy situations. But uh, when you come round, or you get called over, that Mother Ilsa is awake. And she's tied up. And she's gagged. And her holy symbol's been removed. And uh, when you come into camp, or into the tent where she is kept, she's just, like, tied to one of these cots. You know, tied at the, the ankles, tied at the shoulders, and that old American cartoon style where you, like, tie someone up and leave them on the railroad tracks for, like, a, a train to come and run them over. It's very much that, like, you know... Am I the train, Neil? Am I the train? No. All right. I think this... Mo Before she steps out of her tent to go over to Ilsa, I think Elaine needs, like, five minutes. She needs five minutes to... just swallow down her disappointment and her anger and the fact that somebody who was supposed to be a leader for their people brought them into that much misery and made them attack her people as well right she tries mm. to not think about the giant bloodbath that has happened here just like a day or two ago mm -hmm. um and she needs a short moment to let go of all these feelings to be able to properly talk to that person because otherwise she's afra afraid of losing control like it's um she knows she needs to keep her shit together so she she tries her best to take those take those five minutes and build up that wall around her that you need when you are a commander in charge and then she steps into Ilsa's tent yeah you step on into the tent. There's the cleric. Her eyes are open. They're a little bit bloodshot from the wounds that she's taken to the face and body. She's tied up on the stretcher, on the, the cot. Um, there is a soldier inside standing watch over her. Um, you can see that there's like a, a good look of disdain on the soldier's face. Um as they, they watch the cleric who brought these people to this, you know, because of this cleric's actions, all you and all of your soldiers had to come to this, this godforsaken place and suffer the wounds and pains that you've suffered. You can see that the soldier watching this cleric is keenly aware that she is responsible for all of this and is uh, strongly emoting like detestion and wrath I think for a second when I look at her I just remember Carl being burnt alive in his armor valiantly fighting to mm. his last moment right and Elaine tries to swallow it back down because she has felt what it felt like to have those blisters on your skin and to be cooked in your own armor and what a terrible way that is to go but mm -hmm. you know she tries to swallow it down and just 
have have the most neutral expression she can muster right now. I like, guess is she gagged right now? Is it's a gag oh, yeah. door? Absolutely. She... Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and I'm going to uh take take off the gag for a moment. First I'm tugging, making sure her hands are still tied. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not either that I think she has any spells, but I'm not, you know, an expert on spell casting for clerics, so mm -hmm. who knows how that works. Mm-hmm. And I will I guess she's she's like crouch. I will sit sit like I'll just sit down opposite of her. And take out a gag. Ah, finally, she says. <coughs> Some respect. I'll blankly stare at her. Well, now's your chance to speak if you wanted to. I... <coughs> I am Mother Ilsa, cleric of Mathis, god of knowledge from the summer months. I insist that you untie me Treat me with the respect due my station. I'll look at her and I'll say, Okay. I'll give you a second try. Try again. I am Mother Ilsa, cleric. Of Mathis, god of knowledge, I speak for the divine here on earth. Untie me. I'll sit there. I'm going to pull out the ration that I that I brought for her. I'm going to open it up. And I'm going to slowly start eating. And I'll be like, oh yeah, all right then. I don't have a snack here right now, so that mm. will be that will be mm -hmm. great. So I'll just be like, you know, I'll open something. I'll be like, all right, okay. Is this how you treat the mouthpiece of the gods? Do you have no propriety, no respect? Do you wish to be damned for all eternity? To have your life haunted by misfortune? I lost many good people yesterday. That was a great misfortune, and it was not the god's fault, but it was yours. I'll take off, so Elena has a necklace around her neck and she's put Kel Goblin Stompen's signet ring on it as well to not lose it. And she like opens the necklace and she fills off the ring and she like quietly puts it in front of her and she said, what did you do to them? I tried to save our kingdom. I led brave warriors, heroes, in a desperate fight for our very souls. Well, it sounded to me like they didn't follow you as willingly as you first had thought. It sounded like there was some uh, discussion about that. Is that right? A shepherd must lead their flock, and sometimes... Sometimes the sheep do not know where they should be going, and you have to bring them there. Yes, it took time to convince them of the truth of the world, but that is my role. That is my, my position. I bring mm -hmm. the light of truth. I bring knowledge, and not everyone is always willing to hear it especially when it's painful, 
especially when it's easier to believe the lies we have been fed. All right. Tell me about it. Untie me. This is not dignified. I I shake my head. Listen, you can have dignif you can have dignity or you can try to tell me the truth. There's not both. And as far as I know, you're a cleric of knowledge, no? So shouldn't be imparting your knowledge shouldn't that be your priority over honor? Ooh, give me a charisma check. That's a pretty that's a pretty uh dastardly no a nasty line good line <laughs> dastard dastardly and it kid strikes kid. to the core of her being is what i'm trying to say oh my god and it's Where delivered it aid? <laughs> it's delivered so well <clears throat> she settles into her bindings many clerics died during the war in the ending days we were struck down in great numbers by assassins, by murderers, through accidents and misfortune. There was a concentrated effort to, to silence the words of the gods. I made it through via luck, fortune, whatever you want to call it. I had the privilege of being in the room when decisions regarding the second mixed infantry company were made and we were to be taken to White Shore. I was there with the other commanders with, she kind of looks at you, with the great Lady Pentelin, who commanded the armies in the east. And I stood outside the room when the great Lady Pentelin spoke with the queen. And I saw the queen enter, and I saw the queen leave, and I saw her consorts, and I saw I was given a glimpse of the truth of her consorts. They are not the humans they pretend to be. Twisted creatures they are underneath. Mathis, god of knowledge, his twin, Safia, goddess of wisdom, they showed me the truth of the situation. And I knew something was wrong. I have seen it with my own eyes. It has been revealed to me by the divine. Who would say such things if they were not true? Who would lay here and make up such lies? To what end would that how could that help anyone? Well, if you're honestly asking, it would help any enemy of the Empire of Drekes to sow doubts, wouldn't it? I am not the enemy of Drekes. I have been here my whole life. This is where I'm from. My family is here. What remains of them, at least? My people, my flock, my whole purpose is here. I am a cleric here to guide my people. You are one of them. You must listen to me. There is something happening at the top levels of the empire. The queen is being, she's being manipulated. She's being misled. She's being lied to. I don't know if she knows it herself or maybe she is in on it as well. But at the very top, something is wrong. You can smell it. If you're there, there's evils at the top of the empire. You know, if I walk through my camp right now, what I can smell? I can smell the blood of 30 good soldiers who've died there yesterday because you let them 
because of an idea you had. You are aware that many good of your sheep have died because you were leading them straight to their demise, yeah? They died for a good cause. They died to save the souls of all Drakissians. If you don't want what happened to Eridon to happen to us, you will listen to me. You will unbind my ties. And together, we shall make a plan to save our people. So you don't want to happen to us what happened to Eridon, but you would appreciate it if what happened to Akuba would happen to us? There is a difficult path before us. I will not shy from it because it is hard. I do not want bloodshed. I want to reveal the truth. If we go east, we can find help. We can find... We can find those. We can build a plan. We can reveal the queen and her consorts for who they are in front of everyone. We can reveal the truth of the situation. Let me... Let's just say I would buy all this, okay? Let's say I would buy all this. How would going east help us? I don't know anybody out in the east. I'm from Drekis. I live in Wickthorn Renta. There's a, a great kingdom in the east, led by a powerful cleric of Astaire, god of society, of order, of law, of truth, father of the god of justice. The White Prince is a good man. He has been blessed with long years. He has led his people to fame, to fortune, to prosperity. They have they have done away with the evils on those islands. They have slain pirates. They've, they've d- put down menacing dragons. The White Prince will have the knowledge and the spells to help us reveal to the people who the Empress and her consorts truly are. And when the people see what is happening, they will know what must be done. There are many good, noble, honorable soldiers and knights and clerics and cooks and servants in the castle and they will do the right thing. I'm going to lean a little bit closer and I'll, I'll lower my voice a tiny little bit and I'll say, uh, we can't just walk up to another island and request to talk to the White Prince. It's impossible, you do realize that. You can't, but I am a cleric of Mathis and I come with a problem that needs the light of truth. If the White Prince is as good a man as they say he is, he will aid us in our quest and what else are we going to do not try just let demons slowly rip our kingdom apart from the inside out we must try no matter how hard it is no matter how many people must die in the process we must do this thing Elaine Uh, Elaine Pentelin are you going to be part of the problem or are you going to be part of the solution your people need you Your kingdom needs you. The gods need you, Elaine. Mm. Is that what they told you? That's what I tell you. I speak for them. That's very interesting because the last thing I heard was that you are going to commandeer us, kill me, and take my ship. That doesn't sound like you need me, does it? My plan. <clears throat> My plan has been fraught with problems. I am a cleric. I am not a tactician. I am not a logistics officer. I cannot sail a ship. 
I can fight in combat somewhat, but my strength lies in knowledge, in knowing truths. <clears throat> I am a cleric of Mathis, one half of the twin gods. It is all I do. All I do is knowledge, and I know the truth, and I need your help. And is that what Mathis has imparted to you, that what you need to do is to convince these people on the ship to um, mutiny uh, and to come to this island and to be traitors? Is that what's, what they told you? He or was showed that me your idea. He showed me the truth of the Empress and her council. From there, it is clear what must be done. You may... You are not a cleric. You do not understand. The gods no longer come down to Earth and tap you on the shoulder and explain to your face all the details. They work in mysterious ways. They show you glimpses of things and you are expected to understand. If you are a good cleric, you know their will, you know what they want, and when they give you the gift of insight, you know what to do. And do you think that's right? That you did know what to do? If you look back at all this, do you have no regrets? I regret nothing. I'll just think back of all the people who've, who've fallen at the misery, at the emaciated soldiers that have attacked this camp, at people desperate for food trying to slay a polar bear. And... There is a point to be made that even if you're a commander, even if you don't if you, if you have to make the decisions you make, that doesn't mean you have no regrets. Elaine has, gr has great regrets. If she thinks of Carl dying there, if she thinks about not being able to save, um, like, Gregor from the ice, she has collected a whole bunch of regrets on this island. All right, and she looks at, at the cleric, and she just says, you know, have you ever thought about that there's a great deal of knowledge that should have been just kept a secret instead? Just because it's knowledge doesn't need, doesn't mean it needs to be imparted on everybody out there. Are you... Are you saying you too know what's happening? Is your aunt, your great aunt... Grandmother, whatever your relation is, is she part of this too? How far down have the demons reached? Have they offered you things? They will offer you your greatest desires. What mm. is it that you want, Elaine? Acceptance? I'm familiar with your family. I've served under your under the great lady Pentelin, commander of the armies in the east. I'm aware of your family's shames. Have they offered you a way to overcome the problems of your status and birth? If only you will silence the truth. Is that what is happening here? Be careful about the bribes you take. You know, funnily enough, the demons have never hurt me in my entire life. It's always just been people who told me that I'm a great shame for my family and, you know, what what I wouldn't do to rise up in the ranks. And then I keep, all I keep meeting is people who think that they should have power, have power over others because they know better and that there is no regrets to be had for following the right path, you know? And I truly and honestly believe that if whatever you do in your life, 
it should be something that ensures that life is better for all of us together. And that is the right thing to do. And not whatever brings the greatest honor and not whatever brings the the truth and all these things out. I think what is best for us is whatever makes that farmer not hide his corn, whatever makes that Kel not betray his vows and whatever doesn't lead people astray in a frozen wasteland where they have absolutely no choice but follow the words of a cleric because clerics are so good at speaking aren't they and they're so good at giving people hope but in the back people will be starving while they're listening to their words and that is how i see that whole thing and no no demon has ever whispered to me except maybe maybe they are right now what do i know right i know nothing i know nothing about the gods I think many of the things you have just said are very true. And I think I was wrong. It's not my job to lead people to the White Prince and bring them back to save Drekus. It's my mm -hmm. job to tell you the truth, Elaine Pentelin. And you, with your connections, with your family, with your positions, you will be within the kingdom. After this, when you report home, you'll be promoted, you'll be given a feast, you'll be sent out to do something else. And I want you to keep an eye open, to pay attention to the things happening behind the scenes, to the people who they put in power, the people who issue orders, I want you to take this knowledge I have given you here and sit on it and think on it. And when you are finally in a position to do something about it and all the things I told you have been verified to be true, I think you are the one who will save this empire. I'm... I'm just... I'm just an intermediary. It's you who will save us. Do not forget my words. <laughs> Elaine hears that, and I think a few years ago it might have actually appealed to her. You know, the thought of being a great person who will save other people and who will, people will cheer for. You know, somebody who stands out and despite everything they are, they are going to be loved and, and all these things. But Elaine's a bastard, mm -hmm. right? I mean, she meets people, she meets this simple soldier, she meets this cleric and everybody tells her she's the shame of her family. Nobody cares what she's achieved. Nobody cares that she's out here leading troops all by herself, right? Mm -hmm. That she's been giving a great deal of responsibility. Um, everybody will just look at her and just put that put that stamp on her for what she is. And it's never going to change. I mean, she heard those people talk about the McGarry brothers. It doesn't matter how many dragons you slay. It doesn't matter whether you save the the empire. It, it doesn't matter because people will not acknowledge that. All they will know is, well, me and my in my tiny house, I, I feel like this. I'm hungry, I'm scared. You know, it, it, it doesn't matter that the opposite might be you were actually burned down by a red dragon and you might be dead instead. So mm -hmm. you don't be thankful for what you have. She realizes all these things. So she hears the, the charm in that, but every day she's being shown that no matter what you do, if you're a bastard, if you are like what whatever stand like if you are anything less but reputable people will always judge you it doesn't matter what you do mm -hmm. right? there's always going to be judgment so she she can see both these these sides and she pushes that flirtation of of you know, great success, and she could be that great leader away. Because what Elaine always felt was like, 
she's responsible for the people here and she leads them to her best ability and she is saddened by every bad decision she makes and by everybody who falls and that's the only responsibility she has she has no aspirations greater than that she's trying to do a job and she's trying to do it right and that's as good as it gets so she looks at the cleric and she leans forward to whisper in her ear so the other guard at the tent doesn't hear it and she'll whisper you know i might be a bastard but i'm not a traitor And she gets back up from her knees and she throws the uh, the gag binding back to the guard and she says, uh, just take care of her. Mm -hmm. I have no more questions for that person. Yep. The guard will quickly bind the cleric um, <clears throat> roughly and go back to standing guard. And she like slowly turns that that ring that she picked back up in her hands looking at the ring of look of the goblin stompens considering mm. whether they might have been charmed into submission mm -hmm. because when she had that talk in the snow in the field out there with that with that man he seemed to be a very upstanding very honorable person and for a moment i think she just curses the fact that she's a foot soldier and that she's here with just oh. soldiers and why is everything always bigger than us you know like for, mm -hmm. for a second she's a little frustrated because when it comes down to wars many people are just simple people with weapons out there fighting for their lives trying to make decisions based on that and then you have always these clerical people and those wizards coming in with their <laughs> supernatural powers that you can't fathom and everybody expects you to make decisions based on things you can't possibly even understand, perceive, or whatever, you know, and she just tries to push that aside and realize I'm just a knight with a sword and shield, and I'll do my very best based of that, and whatever that lunatic was raving about in that tent does not concern me, because, you know, if, uh, is it Safia? What is it? What is the Safia which one is the, God of is the other side of Mathis? Right. Yeah. So Mathis, if if Mathis desperately wanted this to be knowledge that is imparted on everybody, surely Mathis could talk to Elaine if it was that important to them, right? She figures gods are powerful enough. If that god really wanted to save their cleric, you know, she's right here. Make it happen. I'm ready for the miracle. You know, mm. but as far as I'm concerned, there would have been plenty of opportunity for that to happen, but it didn't happen. So is it really that big of a deal in mm -hmm. the grand scheme of things? You know, she mm -hmm. tries to, to push that aside and have a more <laughs> militaristic clear view of, of things because really the supernatural is hard to understand. Yeah. And I mean, if it was that important, you know, just make make me know that is that important <laughs> yeah elaine's been given a very tough position you know at first it seemed like an easy job just there's some deserters deal with them but even a simple a simple mission like that comes with complexities yeah i think it starts in the planning phase already right because you think okay that's not too bad then you crunch the numbers and you're like okay what how many people are still supposed to be there okay then you get the information that somebody scried on people and you're like okay can i talk to the person who scried no sorry they're busy with a hundred other tasks you know it's like that's not possible mm -hmm. like okay all right then okay let me get a tracker let me get a healer and like, oh, no i didn't think that's going to be and you're like you just run into so many different walls one after another and after a while you realize this is getting very dangerous and very difficult very quickly because the mission we're having is to find the deserters of a you know goblin slaughter group that already wasn't that important so how important are we in the end the answer is not very we're all very disposable on this frozen island 
just as disposable as these other soldiers were. Yeah. Right. So that realization does kick in, but that doesn't deter Elaine from doing her job. All right. Well, Elaine, are you going to keep the cleric and the other deserter alive? I'll keep the cleric alive. The deserter is getting decapitated next morning after he had his food. Okay. Well, same same drill. We don't have to go through it specifically, but we don't he's going to, to get food. It. He will have some last words if they care, um, and then that's going to be that. Okay. Well, we won't go into the details. Let me just roll a d20. There's a little bit of digging in heels and a little bit of, you know, um, uncontrollable, like you know, that sort of whining that happens when in the back of your throat. You don't, you're not trying to complain, but the fear is taking hold but of you. Really, yeah, yeah, you're almost dying, so, you know, you're kind of panicking, <laughs> which is very understandable. Mm-hmm. It, it's, a, it's a very it. understandable, you know, I'm being led to my death to die, but it's over. Everything else can be stored away, stashed away, bodies hidden away. Everyone can gain some more HP. Um, and my question for you, Elaine, before we go to our second break, is what now? Are you going to wait? Are you going to keep the cleric alive until you get home? Are you going to bring them home? Are you going to wait until people are at a certain level of HP and then head out after the enemy? What's what's Elaine's plan? For the remaining this was day the, 19 yes yeah, so the day more. the plan is to rest up further um i will try to bring the cleric back alive because that is one of the main goals and elaine is not a torturer she doesn't mm-hmm. believe that torturing people is also a great way to get to the truth of things mm-hmm. i mean she's worked as a prison guard for a long time so she does have some experience for these for these things you know as a city city guard Mm-hmm. Um, but they said if she can she should try to keep the cleric alive and she will try but she is not going to talk to her anymore mm-hmm. she'll make it very clear that nobody's to talk to the cleric um, and we'll try to bring her back on the ship and see how it how it goes alright well we're going to head to our next break and we will come back on the other side with a little more Rise of Drekus Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Rise of Drekus. There's a lot of waiting. And a lot of waiting. And a lot of waiting. And on day 25, I've already given everyone the HP that they need. On day 25, um, there comes a call. From one of the watchtowers. Watchtowers. That's a very generous term. From the staircase that overlooks the wall. One of your archers sees someone coming through the snow. Is it one person? It's one person in half plate with chain mail and a shield and a sword. It is the last night. The last of the goblin stompins, at least of the of the twins, I guess. Yeah. All right. I'll say hold the arrows, please. And I'll open the door. I mean, I assume I'm wearing my chain mail and my shield and my. Mm-hmm. They're not having out. They're they're not having a bow out or anything, right? Nope. Nope. The knight is fully armed okay. and armored and <clears throat> approaching, um, in plain view for everyone to see. I shall open the gates and I shall step out. I'm not particularly worried mm-hmm. right now. They didn't have any great um, arrows and bows or anything last time they attacked, so I don't expect to be ambushed by that. And yep. I assume to be close enough to throw a spear, I would see somebody. So I'm just going to step right in front of the gate. Yep. And, How much uh, HP have I recovered, Neil, by now? I'm sorry. Is this up to date? I'm just. It is up to date. Yes, <laughs> I've added <laughs> all the HP. You're at 20. Excellent. Good. Very good. I love it. Great. Yep. 20 is amazing. That's okay, some good go. HP. Uh, and the, the archers that you have will take their relative positions on the walls. Um, the person, the knight, is coming up through the, the main entrance. And so 
Um, you can definitely get, oh, I would say four archers have easy, easy shots. And then, why don't I, why don't we actually just do a quick little view of the map, huh? Um, wow. So we're going to move some things around. Uh, I need to grab their appropriate totals. Yes, that's appropriate. Yeah, so they're coming like right up this middle path right over here, right by the front. And uh, there's still a bunch of corpses on this that I'm trying to move out of the way somewhat. <clears throat> uh, and we're going to bring Elaine over here and we're just going to scrap all those and just grab our, our archers and bring them over here as well. I guess they're already on the map, but it's fine. Um, but we'll get, you know, one, two, three, four. These four can easily shoot. Um, and then we will put, uh, I think, Willa and the other three down here. And, you know, the other spearmen around, too. I'm not going to bother placing them all. But the archers have maybe the most important role since they could easily shoot over the walls and wouldn't have to run out the gate. Um... But the knight shows up, and you step out. How far out of the gate would you like to go? Pretty much like that, Neil. This is perfect. I love it. Excellent distance. 10 out of 10. Okay. I will let them walk. They can, they can walk, you know? I'll, yeah. You know, I told people to hold fire. They can come walking. Yeah, the knight will stride forward. Um, <clears throat> shield out. Sword in its scabbard and call out to you. Um, you are the youngest of the Pentelin family, are you not? No, I'm not. They shift uncomfortably. <laughs> this person clearly does not have their family history, mm. right? Uh, you are Kel Pentelin? Of the Pentelin family, I recognize the sigil on your shield. I have served under your great aunt, your your, your grandmother. I'll I like squid at her and just put my head a little bit to the side. Like, I mean, this is we're in a frozen waste, and if people can't remember their noble families right now, that's fine. I'm not going to be insulted by that, and I'll just mm -hmm. say, um, you are Kel Goblin Stompen. You're the sister of Friedrich Goblin Stompen, aren't you? I am. You killed my brother. I say, um, your brother went into his death upright. I'm not sure if he went willingly. He came to you to save us all, to get us all off this frozen hellhole together. You've taken my brother. You've taken my cleric. You've killed my men. I am left with naught but foreign mercenaries who do not speak the common tongue and who have no honor and care not for our futures. I'm just thinking back of Deco for a second, who was one, he was probably one of the most honorable soldiers I've met on this island, mm -hmm. you know, and I just, I'm trying not to think about it too hard and I'll say, um, I understand your anger. What do you have to say to me? I am here for a good death. And she will reach to her side and she will draw her sword and, um, she will roll for initiative. <laughs> My god, these knights, they never give you a break, do they? What, what else is she supposed to do, hmm? 
How much AC do I have now, Neil? Just asking for a friend. 18. Is that up to date? It is not. So it's 18 and then 15 yeah, for go. back at the... Chain, chest, oh. chain, limbs. There we go. Yep. You're at 18. She's at 18. Right? Is that what she's at? Uh... Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, she's at 18. Which means she would have fully recovered every now that she went back. Uh, do, would you like to roll for initiative? I'm rolling for initiative, Neil. Okay. Are you giving any commands to your archers? I'll tell, I'll tell people to hold their shots. Okay. Are you ready for me to roll really bad? Can you roll worse Ooh. than a 14? Let's, well, let's figure it out, shall we? Um, 13. Just kidding. Just to pass. <clears throat> All right, Elaine Pentolin, you uh -huh. are the first. All right, I'm going to walk up to that nice lady and slam into her with uh, my arming sword, Neil, if I may. You may. Uh, now you're doing an arming sword attack and a shield punch. You're not doing like a, a shield rush or bash no. or whatever. Okay. I'm not rushing. I'm going to just arming sword and then shield punch her. Yeah. Five Which is a miss. a miss. It's not a very good hit. And a natural <sighs> 20 with the shield. All Which right. is just a regular hit. No crits. Has to clear by five. Which is 1d6, I believe. We corrected that too. Yes. And I don't get a... Do I get a damage plus four shield? Uh, not unless you have... Yes, you do, because you have high strength. D6 plus, plus one. Plus one? Yes, ma'am. Right. Let's go. Oh, it's just a two. All right. Excellent. <clears throat> the knight Fair enough. deflects the sword strike, takes the shield blow, which kind of like top the shield, cuts into her face, uh, you know, breaking skin, leaving her gums bleeding. And she will do what she does. Uh, she has a shield. She has a sword. <laughs> and she will strike with the sword, which is a 13. It's no good. And she will strike with the shield. Does she have dual wielding and uh, shield proficiency? Does she have both? Wait a minute. Why did she only roll <clears throat> at plus three to hit? She should be rolling well, if at she's, plus If she's four. doing the shield punch as well and doesn't have dual wielding, then her to hit gets a minus from the shield as well. Though, um, right? Her shield attack will have a penalty on it, but her, her sword attack shouldn't. But that should have been... Don't you get a penalty if you shield attack and you don't have dual wielding? Um, I thought you do. You do. You do. I think you do. Your like your yeah. main hand attack gets worse if you shield no, no, punch gets... and you don't have dual wielding. Yes, it does get a penalty of one. Is that offset by? <laughs> it's I think you by, by high yeah. dex. It's yeah, a high yeah, dex yeah, yeah. or. Um, having dual wielding because that's why I took dual wielding so main hand attack wouldn't get worse if I shield punch okay, no, but her dex isn't high enough to to ignore that but still there that that role should have been calculated differently but it's fine it's fine it doesn't matter it's not why we're here it's fine uh, it's a 13 right. and it's a miss and the shield will come across and she should be rolling at uh, plus one with the shield which is just a three so the two of you, you know, right. exchange blows in the first round. Does her AC get, get worse because she has a shield or does she have a shield proficiency? She has the per shield proficiency. Shield proficiency right. and shield specialization. So she gets to the keep the round, AC. Do we roll for initiative? Yes, we do. We always roll for initiative. Seven. I'm going to attack with the arming sword for a second. Time. Four, 23. It is a critical Ladies hit. Ladies and gentlemen. Woo, is it? Yes, it is. You clear by Does five. She, she has 18 AC. My goodness. It's exactly so what roll... you needed to roll. The sword will... So I rolled 2d8 plus 3. Yes. For 12 damage. Mm -hmm. She has like a high block and your sword slides 
down her blade and then sort of past the handle guard over that plate mail pauldron and just like right into where the coif on her neck has been moved by all the by injured by the combat moved in the the middle of battle and she will take a whopping 12 points of damage almost dying uh, uh, and you have an right. offhand with your shield i'm going to shield punch her for 10 which is a miss mm -hmm. and she can do 1d 20 plus it should be three four minus it should be three 1d20 plus 3 it's a 7 oh, and with the rough. shield right. it's a it's a natural, natural one. one i think the the blow to her neck is causing her to lose focus to lose blood things are getting a bit woozy her her next attack is a wild miss and then the shield punches um you know brings her almost to her knees and she has to end up like resting on the bottom of her her kite shield to prevent herself from falling over. You have a second attack at the end of the round, which is right now. Right. Um. <laughs> okay, I'm going to strike her again with my arming sword. And Sorry. It's another twenty. It's another critical hit. As she falls to her knees, the kite shield not supporting her tired, starved, weakening body. Elaine Pentelin will, I think, drive your sword. If you want to describe it, you can, but I'm imagining like right down the clavicle as she kind of drops before you. Yeah, and I think she has this, she has a split second of hesitation where she looks her goblin stomping straight in the eyes and this moment where she just looks at her and she's like not blinking acknowledging that this person was trying to do their job that they might be charmed or not that out here in the frozen wasteland all that doesn't matter and that all that matters is that she brings her people back home as safe as she can and then she drives in a long sword for 2d6 plus three damage which is eight which is more she than rams enough it in as far as she can and the night falls in the snow and that? elaine pulls out her sword and she um strokes it across the snow puts it back in the scabbard and she'll kneel next to the Cal for a moment. She'll have a look around and try to see if any of the other deserters are around. No. Any of the Solomies? They'll make me a perception um, check. There's none. If they're around, they're hiding, right? But they're they're not obvious. If you're if you're looking, you should. Oh, I'm great at perception checks. Are you ready? Let's have a look. Mm hmm. A 29! No, that's actually a really good perception <laughs> check. Uh, you, you don't see anything. You see the one set of tracks, and you see the stillness everywhere else. <clears throat> I'm going to cross her, cross her arms over her chest, um, thinking about what the other cow goblins stopped and told me, that their family had been fighting goblins for years and years. It's probably where they had their, have their name from. Mm -hmm. Right, people who take on the small threats of the kingdom without hesitation, and these are the first goblin stompins who did not go out to do their job, mm -hmm. who have now died because they did not follow their name or not what they were meant to be. Um, and she'll cross their hands and she'll give them a tiny squeeze and she'll stand back up and she'll say, um, <clears throat> Let's bring her inside. All right. The body can be brought inside. It can be stripped of its armor as needed. Its possessions did as she needed. Have any, did she have any letters on herself? Probably not, I take it. No. No. She brought nothing with her. <clears throat> she brought no backup bags. She brought no food. She brought no water. She brought no sidearm. It was just her armor, her shield, and her sword. Um, did she have and... a signet ring as well? She does. Mm -hmm. I'll take yep. the second signet ring and put it on my necklace as well. All right. Um, and she also looked a little bit maybe healthier, like she wasn't eating half or quarter rations in these last this last week and a half or so that she's been on her own with those mercenaries. 
Like she's been bulking mm. up, bulking getting ready up for this. For this, for yeah. this opportunity. Yeah. Well, we're going to skip through the remaining days on this island pretty quickly. Because it doesn't sound like you're going to go out and search for the remaining mercenaries. No, I think um, what was really important to Elaine was to get some closure with this knight as well. Um, mm -hmm. She doesn't know exactly what's going to happen to the last Solemnese mercenaries, but she's not keen on hunting them down and risking all the lives of all the people here mm -hmm. right now. So if they and... attack when the ship comes in, then that's understandable, but it feels like these people are on their last legs no matter what. Yeah. And the real deserters that you needed to get were the the Drakissians, right? The a mercenary yes, group I've... that betrays you is, is one thing, but it's it's categorically different than your own people betraying you. Right. I mean, you, she does have the job to do, and in the end, they are they are the same sort of deserters. But um, it's better to do a job at ninety five percent than to do one at one hundred percent and lose one more of the good people she was trying to save here. She's willing to take that that blame on her. Like mm -hmm. she's she's fine by being like, okay, this is the decision I made. It seemed like the best decision uh, for this camp. It seemed like we could get the cleric like this without having to risk any more resources. So she's willing to justify herself for this. She doesn't feel like this is that a big that big of a deal, you know. Okay. Well, five days later, right on time, your boat will show up, and the person that you have stationed out there to watch for it will let you know that they're there, and <laughs> um, you can quickly pile everyone on board the ship you mm -hmm. can uh, i think the ship is called the wind speed it's captained by yishun a rather tall and lean man with extravagant tastes he's decked out in the finest of clothing he doesn't look cold at all he's got these like reds and these greens and these bright blues and he's got like you know pearl earrings all over his neck and these silk scarves that are coming off and this like tricorn hat with like multicolored feathers <laughs> off of it and golden rings I... and you know he doesn't take care of his teeth and so he's got all sorts of like gold <sighs> fillings all over the place i think in deep inside elaine is a little bit embarrassed that she's so relieved to meet this man again you know <laughs> a certain mm -hmm. amount of shame around that one when she she knows that the boat arrives and she looks into the faces of her people and i think she you can tell the you know the relief mm -hmm. and just the happiness that this nightmare is finally over and it's like this giant boulder has been lifted off her shoulders for that moment. And she's never been more grateful to see such a ridiculous figure on a, standing on a boat. Mm hmm. Well, they'll bring over some long ships. Um, and you've got we the, want the... To, we still want to make sure that the beach is safe and nobody tries to, like, you know, do a desperate attempt on our lives very last second. Mm hmm. As in charging us on the boat or something like that. So. Yeah. And I think you sure and your soldiers are, are concerned and worried and you set up guards and you're taking all these like very careful protective actions. These like sailors pull up on a couple of long ships to pull everyone off the boat and pull all the supplies and, you know, pack everything up and go home. And they're like completely oblivious to any of these dangers. They're pulling up and walking around and be like, well, oh, wow, we'll, we'll it's a bit chilly. Once... <laughs> oh, man, we got to get this <laughs> stuff they... out of here quickly. <laughs> once they're over, I'll tell them that we need to do a quick job and that there might still be people here, you know, but five of them i believe mm -hmm. yeah that could ambush us so we still need to be on the lookout sure but it'll take uh, a couple of days to pack up all the stuff uh, it's mostly just hauling the gear around because you have so few people left to haul you know the remaining food break down all the tents bring all the gear yeah. elaine um, will make sure to be also a great part of it like she'll try to put in all the her muscle uh mm -hmm. to you know haul stuff and make sure this gets done as quickly as possible she just wants to get off this island get her stuff done and just be safe and just not be freezing anymore because she's tired of this place you know mm -hmm. whatever great mysteries what kind of mind was that on the mountain you know what happened to the other building she does not care she doesn't have the meaning she doesn't have the capacity she just wants to go home. You know? Why is this island frozen? 
No one knows. Not it still my, not, hasn't figured none out. None of my business. Send a wizard. Send a cleric. You know, send anybody who cares about these things. I don't bath. I'm tired of this place. I'm tired of all these. Uh, we have to literally haul dead bodies out of the snow back on this ship. I could not care less what the great secrets of this place are. You mm -hmm. know? So that's what we're doing. Excellent. Well, um, are you bringing home any bodies of enemies? Uh, are either the knights' bodies going to be brought home? Any of the um, deserter yes, we're bodies? Bringing the knights. We're bringing. Okay. We're bringing both the knights home, and we're bringing. I mean, the alive body of the cleric home. Okay. We're leaving all the deserter soldiers here. Okay. Um, simply because. Of course. Why would you? It's disgusting bringing thirty corpses with us. Yeah. All right. And well, everything... we're bringing the corpses of our soldiers, though. We're bringing our people back. Ah. Uh, as the first longship arrives on the boat, uh, on the, the the actual ship with the bodies of your ordinary soldiers, um, and then you know that ship comes back to to land, and it still has the bodies of your soldiers that have died, and one of the sailors that's on the ship rowing it back says, uh, "The captain says, is there really a need to bring these dead bodies? Right? They're they're dead. Can't we just bury them here?" I mean, it's going to be a bit of a journey. They're going to thaw. It's going to stink. The whole place is going to reek to the high heavens. Can't we just leave them here? I'll look at a soldier. I'll say, um... 30 of our people came here together. I think it was 30. How many people were when we start, Neil? About 30, right? Yeah. 25. I said... I said, um, we fought together and we will go home together. It's not up for discussion. But like, they're gonna rot. It's gonna stink. That's a lot How of weight. How long is that ship ride, Neil? A couple How of days. How long is that ship ride? Like a day or two. Yeah, come on. I'll, I'll just I'll just look at the soldier and I'll say, "You will hold your tongue and you will show some respect." All right. They'll haul all the bodies on. They'll haul all the gear. Everything can be put on the ship, and you can all sail home. I think when Elaine is on on that boat, she will stand next to Willa. You know, maybe they're loading the last stuff on. And she'll look over that frozen island. She'll look up to the in the direction of where the mountain is. And she will have the the cow goblin stompens ring in her hand. She's going to hold it against against the sun, and she's going to slowly turn it in her hand and think about the things that <clears throat> Ilsa, Mother Ilsa, has told her about how she's probably the chosen one to un uncover this great truth. And she'll think about that letter that cow Go goblin stompen had on his belt the day he died. Mm. And she'll look at Willa and she'll say, uh, Willa, before we report back, I think I might have to make a short visit to someone. Would you be up to accompany me? Um, well, tell Pentelin, I, I follow orders. And until I've been relieved of your command, I have to follow whatever orders you give me. Fantastic, Willa. Then that's an order, I'll say, and I'll slowly put that ring into my pocket and I'll mm -hmm. look out at the last efforts to pull the the campsite together. Mm. Well, in a couple of days, you make it back to the mainland on Solemn. You're coming back to... On Solemn? I'm sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> the mainland on Arcadia. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You're in Solemn now, bitch. <laughs> like, what? What's this no. plot twist? <laughs> you arrive in Bon Theris, um, and the cold of the Talons is left behind. It's warm. There's people running around on the docks. There's, you know, the city is filled with life. The destruction from the war has mostly been repaired by now. There's, there's still some areas that are being fixed, but they're being built back better than ever. Um, you know, there's, there's plenty of food and wonderful beverages and interesting smells. And it appears that there's some sort of like carnival or festival 
festival or fair in town or like a circus of some kind because there's these like brightly colored tents set up just outside of the city walls um, and there's these big bonfires and it's it's loud it's noisy it's um eventful and excited as you pull up onto the docks and everything gets sort of offloaded uh, by the workers there, there's a, <clears throat> a servant dressed in, you know, fairly modest garments who meets you and will bring you, just you, uh, to your new quarters because your commanding, not commanding officer, but the, the noble to whom you report, uh, Lord Richard Marshall, uh, would like a word with you um, in two days. He, he scheduled the meeting for two days because, you know, the ships take a little while. And they're going to put you up in some nice quarters here in Bon Theris so that you've got a, a good place to stay for the next two days while awaiting this meeting. Next, um, and I shall make sure everything of my equipment is, like, cleaned uh, and repaired, and I shall uh, look representable. And I'll also make sure that Willa is uh, giving a new cloak that she looks fine enough whenever she comes with me. Yeah. Um, you'll have... This servant will also take care of all of your needs. You know, when they see you in your chain mail that you've borrowed from a dead person, um, they'll ask what happened to your armor, and then they'll volunteer to... Well, they'll say that it's their responsibility to see that your gear is fixed and repaired, and they'll take your armor and have it... Um, <clears throat> you know, whatever needs done, they'll, they'll make sure it's taken care of. Yes. And, uh, you and I'm very Willa... grateful for him being able to hand off a little bit more responsibility to somebody else. You know, I guess when you are uh, coming back from a frozen wasteland and from fighting and carnage and from everything that's happened to this place, it's, it feels a little bit surreal. Mm -hmm. And even if you are commander, it can be slightly overwhelming. So it's it feels good to just have somebody take off <laughs> over these things for now. Yeah. Yeah, you'll get two days in Bon Theris, uh with Willa and the other soldiers who are all here. Most of the most of your remaining soldiers are actually still Do they hauling take the cargo cleric off our hands. What, what's happening to her? Oh, absolutely. Yes, uh, a detachment of guards is here. You know, the the city guard is here, and when they hear that there's a, a prisoner that's being brought back, they appropriately arrest her, and they have issue. You know, they've already got orders from Lord Richard Marshall that, you know, if there's any prisoners, we're going to take them back to Wickthorn Rorenta, and all of your responsibilities are quickly, you know, absorbed by other people, mm. um, to the point that even if you wanted to talk to the cleric one more time or to start issuing orders to people, like your job is done. Someone else is taking care of everything from here on out. Not only is it not your responsibility, um, it's not my position at all. Like yes, it's, I, I do and, not get to try. Yes, yes, yes it's all. I think over. it's just one more, one more chance for Elaine to understand that you have a job to do. You do the job. You stay in line, and that's that. Right? Mm -hmm. Nobody employs you for, I don't know, your opinion or. <laughs> Mm -hmm. on what to do but you literally do your job and then you're done and that's all you have to do yeah. yeah is there anything in particular elaine would like to do in the two days she has in bob theris this like nice warm pleasant city at the edge of a river that leads into the sea and there's like a fair and a carnival and sights and sounds and civilization and warmth and and no more violence and no more danger I would like to go to a really nice... I guess I'm staying at a really nice tavern. Where am I staying for those two days? Oh, you're staying in one of the nicest inns in town. It's been recently rebuilt after damage from the war, and so your room is filled with the newest stuff. Now, resources are sort of scarce, and so, uh, you know, you've got, like, a nice wooden... Um, uh, what is it? What's the desk with the mirror on it? The, a nice vanity in this room, because it's like mm. a noble's room. Um, but, like... Mm -hmm. There's no varnish at this point in time. Varnish mm -hmm. and uh, finishings for these things are, are in short supply. So it's well carved and sanded, but like it hasn't been stained appropriately. And it's got a brand new mirror on it. Um, and you can see that the mirror's got like some dents. Like this is definitely a repurposed mirror that's been repolished and tried to be smoothed out. But like, you know, it's still pretty good. Um, mm. Yeah. I think she's going to have a really nice hot bath one evening there. And she's going to, after having had the bath, she'll stand in front of the vanity in the mirror and she'll look at those giant claw marks, you know, that, that are slowly healing on her mm. on her shoulder. And she's just looking at the, at 
her pale self <laughs> mm -hmm. in that mirror and like carefully touch the place where she realizes that she has barely escaped a death mm -hmm. that she didn't even sign up for you know she signed up to find and capture these deserters and kill them bring them to justice whatever but it was like viciously attacked just by nature itself <laughs> mm -hmm. i think she just tried just tries to come to terms with that moment which was one of the scariest of her lives and i yeah. think um while she's staring at bon Therese, she'll also pay for willa to have a room here yeah, I mean, in that, will has in that been tavern. granted um a tent in the field outside with all the other soldiers no, um, I mean, she doesn't have... I'm not sure, does she need to commandeer them still? She doesn't. I feel like people will just go f get funneled back into army business, right? And you just stay at the camp with, like, whoever is there. So I will I will try to make a make a, the case that Willa can stay with me in that tavern and is relieved. Like, I'll put mm -hmm. in a request for her to be relieved from duty because I desperately still need her for uh, the debriefing of this mission for the next few days. So I'll grant yeah. her, like, a little, a little leave and she'll come... She will come with me to probably the nicest tavern she's ever been to in her mm -hmm. lifetime. Yeah, <laughs> and it's definitely the sort of thing where your remaining soldiers are sort of placed on the side until everything is said and done, and then they'll be, you know, redeployed somewhere else or, or let go home or whatever it is. Um, so Willa staying with you instead of over there, not a problem. No mm -hmm. one cares. Okay. Um, if we have like a quiet evening in that tavern. I guess. Yeah, well, will... before then, you will be yes. visited by a doctor, or what passes for a doctor in this time and age, a, a healer, a non-magical healer, who will come mm -hmm. and put, you know, a poultice on your shoulder, stitch things up, clean things out, you know, look over your extremities, make sure you're not frostbitten, check your eyes, check your mucus, you know, do all the, the doctorly things. <clears throat> um... And then later that day, you will be visited by a low-ranking cleric of Martha. Just like a, a second-level cleric will show up and kind of knock on your door and say, Excuse me, um, cleric of Martha here. I will, I will open the door and I'll say uh, greetings. Hi, I'm Mother Lily. Um, I hear that you are Elaine Pentelin and in need of clerical healing. Who told you that? Um, o orders came down from Lord Richard Marshall that the knight in charge of some expedition has come back and is injured and could use some attention. I say, um, Arrow Island in the Talons. Oh, that sounds nasty. May I come in? I'll, I'll have a quick look at it. Does she have, like, a symbol of Martha and all that stuff on her? Yeah, Link's golden rings dangling down uh, her neck. She's got white robes on. She's young. She's, like, 18, maybe 19 years old. <laughs> She's got, like, hope and joy in her eyes. She seems pretty happy and, you know, going about her duties. Clearly, I think know, maybe a, first or second level cleric. Like, real early I think on. On, mm -hmm. on any normal day, Elaine would have just waved her in with any, without any second thoughts. But she feels so... She feels a little weirded out by clerics right now because of what happened with Mother Elsa. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, so she does have... She's, she probably comes off as a little bit more standoffish than she usually would. But she will still she will still nod and she'll wave, mm -hmm. uh, wave the, the cleric in. Mm -hmm. She... Comes on in and says, oh, the Talons, I hear that there was a, a whole bunch of deserters down there. And they, they captured a cleric and and took off a bunch of Solomese mercenaries. Did you get them all? Oh, yeah, we got we uh, we got them. There's no worries. There's no worries at all. I think a whole bunch of people made very poor decisions down there. But, you know, oh. um, were, were you able to save the cleric? I think it was Mother Elise, right? That's that's the name I heard. Mother Ilsa. Oh, Mother okay. Ilsa. Um, Is she okay? Yeah, she's been safe. She's been returned to the capital. Oh. I'm sure she will have to, a lot to say. You know, she must have had a terrible experience. I imagine. Mm, you know, you can never really trust a mercenary. They're only in it for the money and... I know how times are tough, and there's shortages of everything around, but you gotta keep an eye out for those mercenaries. 
Um, anyway, well, you know, I th I think we really have to keep an eye out for each other. I think that is what matters. I'll say, and I'll gently pat her hand. Oh, she'll put like a hand on your wounded shoulder and be like, "That's so true." Here, let me take care of you. Let me do my part for the empire. Yeah. Uh, and she'll say a prayer to Martha, and your flesh will knit over by two hit points because uh, she's Amazing. new. But you know, it's it's something. It's well, something. She's trying her best. We appreciate it, Lily. Well done. Look at you go. She gives you another three because she does have three spells today. Uh, oh, and it's boy. not a lot, but it is something. You know, it does the most of the healing and you'll be mostly fine. Um, and then she'll Excellent. tell you that if you, you need anything, that the temple is open and um, that, you know, you can always come by and find her if you, you need to talk about what happened over there. She's a cleric of Martha um, and she's, you know, here to help. I'll tell her, I'll say, um, well, I said my prayer to Martha out there, and I'm sure it helped me every day that I stayed on that frozen wasteland. Well, I bet. The gods are always here for us. They're always trying to help. Have a yeah, good day, isn't that, Kalpentalin. Isn't that the truth? Have a wonderful day, uh, sister, mother, mother Mo Lily. Mother Lily, yep. Mother Lily. Right. Um, yeah, you said you wanted to talk with Willa later that night. What's the what's the vibe of that conversation? What are we? I think I'm not sure there really is a vibe. I think Elaine just needs time to try to adjust back to normal society mm. before she goes to a social event, you know? Mm. So they are both sitting in this crowded tavern. I take it it's crowded tavern room oh, yeah. because the facilities are on, both with a large glass of wine, and Elaine is just shook to her core by everything that's happened like she's trying to be a good leader she's trying to keep her exterior calm and collected but this was her first big mission as a military leader she's worked for the city guard in redport before and all these things but she's mm -hmm. never seen She's never, and, and she, she has tried to protect with Wickthorn Renta whenever it looked like the attacks were coming down. She's seen the panic, you know, she's, she's experienced a lot of different sh like um, shades of the war, but she's never experienced what it's like when people abandon all hope and when people give in to temptation and when people start starving to death like they did. And it's just, yep. I think it just makes you very aware of, of your own mortality and um of how difficult the concept is of honor in itself and trying to bring honor to your family and doing the right thing and following orders she's just she doesn't want to question these things because she's seen what happens to people that question them but i think right now she just wants to get that chill out of her bones and even though she's no longer in the frozen weather and in the ice I think Elaine still feels very much cold to the core, despite all the warmth coming from, um, you know, the the fire and the people around her. And I think she's just trying to readjust and coming back to reality. And mm -hmm. that's she's having a really hard time with that. Yeah. Well, does the setting help? Because this is a crowded, busy tavern. There's a lot going on here. You know, there's it's standing room only, but. Uh, when you know the knight walks in, a couple of the the lowly peasants will make room at a table for you. Out, out of due respect, you know it's appropriate. You, you give up your your table to the knight, um, and it's packed. There's a lot of people. Drinks are coming by pretty quickly. There's not a lot of time to take orders. Um, there's some performers on the stage. There's like a bard up there uh, who's like putting on a good show. There's a you know, multiple floors here that I'll look into this like main central chamber. And so every now and then like some beer or some beverages will spill from the top floor down onto someone below who will like throw an end of bread back up at them. And someone has to come and break up the, the altercation before it turns into too much of a mess. And some people are getting <laughs> kicked out over here and other people are being brought in. Someone's like passed out on the ground and their friends are dragging them away. But it's a very like, um, joyous and like festive environment here in this very important port city um, where all of the this trade from eastern Arcadia is coming in and out. Does, does this environment help Elaine uh, adjust to the regular world or is this just like 
a massive culture shock. No, I think it does help in the sense of when there's a lot going on around you, you feel less significant. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like when you have your own problems and troubles, the world around you will revolve and it will just go on just as normal. It doesn't matter how hard a time you have. Mm -hmm. Like it will always it will always go on, right? And there's there's a sense of relief in not being the most important person who has to figure this out and carry this, you know, secret and figure out what to do now because she doesn't. Mm -hmm. You know, she doesn't she doesn't have to do anything. She did her job and she's done. Um so she will raise her she will raise a glass for toast towards Willa and she'll say, um well, I would like to toast to Gregor and to Carl and all these brave people that lost their lives for the purpose of, and I look around the tavern and I say, keeping all those people safe who have no idea what happened down there. Willow will lift her mug in, in an exchange with you and she'll just sort of say, <clears throat> We will outlast the enemy. I'll nod and I'll say, um, we will. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you're, you're sipping and sort of soaking in the atmosphere, you will be approached over the course of the evening by multiple other knights um, who are coming in and out through the area and they'll see you and they'll come on over. And <clears throat> uh, I think they're all higher ranking than you. You're, you're pretty... You're pretty junior officer here, but each one will come up and, you know, give you a salute and uh, put out a hand and shake yours and introduce themselves. You know, I am Kel so and so of House such and such, and I'm here on this duty. And, and mm -hmm. I, I, you know, they'll just do a very polite, like, "Hi, I'm I'm a fellow knight. I'm just letting you know who's around." It's very very mm -hmm. normal social stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, how does Elaine think, respond um, to? Yeah. I think Elaine probably brought her shield as well, right? And she just has it leaning up against her, against the side of a chair, simply because it lets people know who you are. Absolutely. Right? Like people yeah. will be able to recognize you. And um, I think she takes this as a training ground for Willa and her to make polite conversation, mm -hmm. practice some etiquette, all these things. She will let people know who she is. She will let people know that she's been just successful in her mission, you know, that um, it's a great honor to fight for Drekis and um, inquiring what other people's missions are and how proud she is to be part of this greater project and all these things. And she'll make Mary sure that her hair is very neatly tucked over her half elven ears mm. as she makes polite conversations and tries to find contacts. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, you'll hear that most she'll of these... be all business, I guess. Most of these people that are coming through Bontheris are working in Eridon. Um, some of them are working in and out of uh, Shirebrook, which is being rebuilt. Some of them are working in and out of Whiteshore, which is uh, being repopulated. Uh, some of them are coming out of Anvil. Some are coming from Wake County and Redport and are traveling through the area because norm uh, relationships are being normalized over there again. How are the Wake, Port Wake Country and Redport people doing? Simply because I've spent a lot of time in Redport, I feel like I have a personal attachment to that area, so I like to hear news from, from there as well. How's that how's it going over there? Um, well, there there appears to be a little bit of conflict going on between the er the kingdom of Eridon, the empire, sorry, the empire of Drekis, and the <laughs> newly fermented Wake County kingdom, kingdom of Wake County, the kingdom, the, the eastern kingdom, they're trying out a bunch of different names, or at least the mm -hmm. Drakisians are apl applying a lot of different names to them. Um, and sort of like a half joking, like you're actually just a county who's pretending to be a kingdom. So we're going to call you the kingdom of Wake County as a, just a little bit of a friendly chiding amongst, you know, fellow states. Um, but apparently things are more or less over there. Uh, there's a, a newly appointed. Was it a king or a queen of Eridon? I don't remember. Did I roll for it? I thought I decided it was a queen, but it, maybe there, you didn't. I can't remember. But the new uh, monarch of Eridon is making a lot of, of talk about 
reuniting Eridon, all of Eridon together. And the people of Wake County are like, no, 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 thank you. We're our own kingdom now. You can kind of take over all the things that were destroyed by demons and that can be yours. But like, we are now our own place. Thank you very much. And the new mo uh, monarch of Eridon is like, no, we have to... We have to bring all of Eridon back together into one new empire again, or new kingdom again. And so there's a bit of like, you know, tensions, but no one wants to get into a fight again. No one wants to go back to, you know, full all out war on the continents of Arcadia after all of this stuff. But there's a little bit of tension. Um, other than that, Wake County is rich. They, they got to play a mercenary, not mercenary, uh, the middleman in a lot of these transactions. They got to sell a lot of weapons and armor and uh, trade between Arcadia and Solemn and Arcadia and the Dardens. And so they're fitting pretty, they're sitting pretty fat and happy. That sounds yeah. good. It sounds like things are looking up for trade and, mm -hmm. you know, bringing some money back into the kingdom. That's always good. Yeah, it's great. Uh, and part of all these people coming from Eridon in the east is that well, the great Lady Pentelin is still technically the commander of the armies in the east, even though she's no longer like in charge of day to day operations. That's still sort of underneath her domain while the new kingdom of Aradon gets sort of built up and gets its own uh, army re rebuilt. Uh, and so when people see your shield, they all stop by because they recognize the Pentelin family. And technically, they're all serving under the great Pentelin. And so, oh, hey, here's another Pentelin. Come on. Hi there, officer. So nice to see you. Oh, yep. yeah, we love your grandmother. She's fantastic. Uh-huh. I'll tell all I'll tell all of them that that shield actually used to belong to my grandmother back in the day and that I'm oh. carrying it in great honor of her service. Mm-hmm. Well, you have many uh, kind officers offering to buy you and your they then look and recognize that this is just like a regular <laughs> bowman sitting with you i'll just i just rope them in so i'll be like oh yeah are you here to to uh, buy my officer and me a me a drink <laughs> that yeah, is so kind yeah. of you yeah. yes we would very much appreciate them should i tell you another story about my grandmother that one yeah. time where she won the tourney unarmored with one lance yes yeah, great they love it. so you know mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very charming, very good. Yeah. All right. Well, that's that for now. In uh, two days, mm -hmm. you have a, a meeting with Lord Richard Marshall, who's the uh, officer. He's the, the person in charge of this operation. He's not part of the military de facto, but in this day and age, you can have a, you know, civilian in He's charge just of a. Some merchant who made it really big, according to. Yeah. Hello. Well, he's a, a, a shrewd businessman who has helped outfit and fund multiple specialty missions, special military operations that the Kingdom of Drekus has been doing. Oh, um, a big fan of skiing and snow, apparently. Hey, when you find that you're good at something, you keep doing that thing. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Very, very exciting. And it sounds um, like you're bringing... What's her face with you? Willa. I'm bringing Willa along, yes. 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 As a... I think as a symbol for the rise of Drekis, you know? Like, mm -hmm. the most loyal people get to try and better their position in society as well. That's what Willa came to do, right? She tried to redeem herself. Mm -hmm. And so she's a symbol of redemption that when you choose to do the right thing, then you can also be rising back up in these times. So yeah, mm -hmm. I do. I think uh, Elaine does appreciate it. So that's her way of showing, I appreciate what you did for me. You can come and stay by my side for now. Perfect. And just Try. maybe it's also less intimidating to do all these things, not by yourself, but it's not like she would ever admit to that. So, you know, whatever. Right. right. All right, I am just looking for the appropriate conversational background. Don't put the halflings on thing here. No, no, we're not doing the halflings. <laughs> uh, this will do us, I think. All right, you and Willa 
can come on into this uh, big stone building just near the center of town, but not actually in the very center of town. I'm um, just off to the side. It's got a, a large warehouse and then some offices that are off to the side of it. Um, it's got these fancy trappings, these big banners of the Marshall family everywhere. Uh, and it's got some soldiers out front, some official military soldiers, and then also some like unofficial local security for the warehouse. Um, the two of you can be brought in to this very comfortable parlor uh, where there's there's this guy. There's Lord Richard Marshall sitting before you. And do I have a do I have a description from him? I don't know if I've ever properly described him. Hmm. No? No? Maybe. Probably the very first background episode in Fro Fro, but I have to admit I did not rewatch that in preparation, so I have no idea what that man looks like. Yeah. It's, um... I don't think I ever have really described him, but he's a handsome man. You know, he's got dark black, uh, thick, dark black hair. He's got, um, you know, fairly nice clothes that aren't too extravagant. They're like tastefully nice. Um, you know, the, the equivalent of like business casual, but with like really nice business casual, like, uh, you know, Armani business casual. Um, oh, and Armani Business Casual. I'm, I'm pulling random names. I, I don't know anything <laughs> yeah, about fashion, no okay? What that looks like, Neil. That's, That's a name. <laughs> That's a suit company who manufactures these things, right? It's casual. All right. Yeah, it's sure. Business Let's Casual. Whatever. Uh, who cares? Fine. What are clothes? Um, right. How old is he, approximately? Uh, I think he's, you know, you know when you see like a... A man who has aged well, and you're like, is he in his 40s uh, or 50s or 60s? I he's don't like know. A fine but like, wine. Mm, okay. Mm, he's got that Keanu Reeves age where you're like, I, I just don't, I just don't know. But he could easily <laughs> be know, in his 40s I don't or 50s. Care. Yeah. He sends him. Got it. Yeah, okay. yeah. No, he's, and uh, he'll see you come in, and he'll stand up to greet you, and then this other person comes in, and uh, he'll do the quick like turn and oh, hello, I'm Lord Richard Marshall. Who are you? And she will stiffly go forward with her, what is it, like five wisdom and six charisma, and be like, <clears throat> I'm Willa. <laughs> He'll look Willa to you. was the officer leading my spear of uh, archers. My platoon, sorry. Ah, non commissioned officer. Well, if uh, Elaine Pendolin has brought you here, you must have done exceedingly well. Thank you for your service. Uh, please help yourself to whatever food or drink you need. Uh, yeah. Elaine, Kelpendolin. Um, I hope I can uh, speak um, informally with you here. I, I, I'm not used to the, the trappings of lordship, and uh, it would be, be nice to just have a conversation without any of the formalities. Would that be all right with you? I'll, I'll say, um, Lord Marshall, I think you are doing your cunning and your capabilities a disservice. I don't think there's any need for you to be humble here, but... I've just returned from a frozen island, so I do appreciate it if we drop the etiquette a little bit. Excellent. You know, my son-in-law, the famed William Marshall, went on a, a similar excursion to a frozen wasteland. He, he was gone for years, and we thought he was lost, and he came back to us in the end, and I'm very appreciative to, to see you coming back as well. I, I don't you and I don't have a, a personal relationship yet, but um, I want to first off say thank you for your service and for the difficult job you have done. I've heard from my staff that there were, that it was a difficult time and that there were not as many survivors as we had hoped. And that, well, I'll leave it to you to tell me about the cleric um, but I know you faced quite a challenging time, and I, I want to thank you for your sacrifices, and well, we appreciate your command decisions. I'll look at him and I'll say, um... So, so Marshall, I just want to say, I... Richard, please. Richard, I appreciate 
the opportunity you've given me. I'm very grateful for your trust. And let me tell you that it was not displaced. We have indeed suffered great losses, but every single loss was worth it. And mm -hmm. if I had a choice, I would go back there anytime, she'll mm -hmm. say after a short pause. Well, hopefully we don't have to do that again. I think I think uh, the Empire of Drakus is done with the snow for a while. Hopefully. That is great to hear. I'll say I cannot imagine what it must have been like thinking that somebody so close to me would be lost in a place like this for such a long time. It must have been unfathomable pain. So I am very happy that your uh, son-in-law has safely returned to you. I think he's done a great service for our empire and he deserves to be back with his loving family. Why, thank you. Yes, uh, he is now the Count of the Golden Sea in North Eridon out of fortune after having slain the, the vicious uh, actually, his name was literally Count Vicious, if you if you know your history. Oh, man. Anywho, um, they're, they're doing quite well, and I think they're quite happy up in the Golden Sea, uh, away from the cold, um, in peace and quiet at, at last. Very proud of them all. Um, now, if you don't mind, uh, it's time to get to business here. Um, I've heard a little bit from what's happened. Could you give me a... A brief recap of who was responsible for the desertion. Um, and I noticed the cleric came back in chains, so to speak. What What did she... What happened? I'll say, um... Richard, forgive me if I... I'll try to make this point as clearly as I can. I'm just a simple you know, night leading people. I'm not an expert in magic. I'm not an expert in the clerical powers, so I can only tell you um, what my understanding of the situation is. I believe a very... a cleric who was led very astray, and don't ask me by what, has tried their best to manipulate the good people of the army into some sort of suicide mission. I believe it was the cleric who used their powers to charm people into becoming traitors. Mm. And I believe they used their power and their stand to um, press people into following them. And it mm. was the cruel nature of the island and the power of that cleric that coerced people into following them. Mm. We've actually had some problems with that. There are these clerics of Varasi, goddess of death and destruction, who have been ritually baptizing people um, killing them and then raising them from the dead. Well, or it's not true raising from the dead, but they, they bring them to the brink of death and then heal them, saying that the, their deaths have, their near deaths have washed away all of their former vows and promises um, and that they are born free once more um, of any pro former oaths and able to restart their lives that they, they are born new born again and um <clears throat> the, these clerics have been in and amongst some of our finest nobles some of our officers um offering people lies that sound like truths absolving them of their sins and turning them against the empire there are still traitors amongst our ranks um, and it sounds like this cleric may have been touched by these these traitors um but, Richard, but, i want but, to mm -hmm. i want to be very clear i have the greatest respect for clerics and i am aware that our empire stretch very thin for them right i do not 
I do not despise the clerics because of what happened, but I do believe that times are dire enough to lead even people of faith astray. Yes, well, the gods are... Like you, I'm no I'm no cleric. I'm, I'm a man of money and man of the things I can touch and the things that I can look at and examine. Um, I'm a man of numbers and spreadsheets and logistics. Uh, and so for me, I see the nature of humanity. Everyone wants something and good people are easily led astray. Uh, I wouldn't presume to know the truth of anything, but I can tell you from the numbers that there are more traitors, more devious clerics. That sounds like this Mother Ilsa, cleric of Mathis, I believe, led astray by, by clerics of Abrasi somewhere in her past. Perhaps. I, I'll give a shrug. I'll say I don't know what happened to her, but I can tell that she did our people a great disservice into pursuing whatever she pursued. And mm. she was supposed to protect a great many people, and she failed in that mission terribly. Now, it's unusual for us to hear of a cleric of Mathis, I mean, at all, but definitely doing something like this. Did she give any reasons for her poor shepherding? I mean, Richard, with all due respect, is it really a reason if you're just rambling on half-staffed on a frozen island? I don't think it's... I don't think I'm the one capable of giving proper answers. I think if you are really interested in the core and the truth of things, you should ask the people who will interrogate her at the capital. I oh. think that would make oh, more I sense. Oh, I will. Yes, I, I mean, I w there will be interrogations. I'll get a full report, but uh, just in the meantime, a, a short answer would be nice. You see, there, there are... I deal with many small problems um, and if there's a, a pattern developing between them I'd like to be aware of it as quickly as possible uh, I will get a, a full detailed report after the appropriate questions are put to her is there anything that she said that was um, even if it was mad ramblings uh, of note uh. He looks well, to Willow. Well, she's she said that she does not trust the queen to be a capable and truthful leader, and therefore we should look towards the white prince for saving. Oh, well, that is a bit mad. That sounds pretty crazy to me. Did she say why we As shouldn't trust the queen? Surely she must have had a reason. No one, you know, deserts with a four, 70 men for nothing. Well, she said the the gods have imparted some knowledge upon her and she has heard some... She must have witnessed something. She must have heard some sort of rumor. I'm not entirely sure. She was just rambling at that point. I see. Just... Completely mad then. <laughs> I'll, I'll look at him and I'll say, um, I can definitely say she was drunk on power. Mm. I can definitely say she did not have any respect for the people that she led astray on that island. And mm -hmm. she did not have any respect for the queen herself. So I take very little stake into what these people say. Of course. I, I want... How do I say then you, you've done a good job, and I understand you've been through hell and back, and you've had little time to reintegrate yourself into functioning society. So, um, I want you to know that we here trust you. We respect you. You, you will be promoted for your actions, um, and that you can speak freely. No one thinks of you as, um, unworthy or tainted by this experience. Um, I, I, I want you to feel comfortable speaking about what has happened to me. I, I nod and I'll say, why would anybody think that I was tainted by this experience? I think it shows my great love and respect 
for our empire to take on this mission with these people over there. And I try to do the best for my people. I feel no shame for whatever mm -hmm. happened. Nor should you. You've done a hard thing. You've lost, by my count, over half your... The people that you brought with you. That's, that's a very difficult bit. Um, I heard you've had to execute a few of these deserters, which I imagine... I, I personally have never never drawn blood because I've lived a soft and easy life and I um, I have nothing but respect for the job that you've done. It's just, we've heard when feeding the cleric, she said some things to one of our our prison guards. Some disturbing things. I, I wanted to know if they were similar to the things that she had said to you. I'll lead forward and I'll say, um, Richard. We live in a time of deserters and of executions. Okay. All I'm going to say to you is, if you would like to ask me a question, you may ask me a question. But please be aware that there are some questions that we should rather not answer unless we want to bring ourselves in danger. So is there a direct question you would like to ask me? Then I will respect that and you shall have an answer. But don't try to press any small talk out of me. That's that's very fair. It's very fair, Elaine. Um, well, is there anything... <clears throat> I, um, are there any... Is the job done? Is there anything left to mop up? Is there anything left to do? The only thing that is left to do is for us to rebuild our trust in each other and our trust in this empire. And to build up the small people because that's where all the doubts start. I sincerely believe that um, all the farmers out there that are being pulled into the army, um, all the people that are, have lost their livelihoods in the war, I think we need to reassure these people. And that's us as the nobles, and that's mm. you people, the, the merchants. We need to make sure that we can rely on each other once again so people are not being led astray by people like Mother Ilsa. I, believe, I strongly do believe that that is upon us. I... And I've, I think that is something we can actively pursue. Yes. I wholeheartedly agree with you, Elaine. There, we're working on it. There are specific traitors in our midst, specific clerics in our midst that are pulling at the fabric of society. And we're... The problem should be resolved soon. Um, and... As peace settles across the land, there will be fewer and fewer needs for soldiers. And as Aerodon rebuilds itself and those people can do their jobs, um, we will no longer need to deploy our own to Aerodon. Things should come back into normal. There's still work to be done, of course, but it's, it's blue skies and smooth sailing ahead. Well, Richard, if there are ever times where I don't have to go on missions anymore to right what's wrong, I would very much like to talk to you about rebuilding after whatever has happened. And well, after we've cleaned out those bad people. Yes. <clears throat> um, you've done a hard thing. It's time for some rest. We, of course, still need your services, but uh, on a for a time being, on a much smaller, much more localized scale, uh, I want you to know that you'll have at least at least a month of time to yourself to see your family and, and do as you please. Uh, and after that, we have some local issues for you to deal with. Um, Fenden 
a city just north of Wickthron Renta um, has been facing some small problems and they're going to need a new uh, captain of the guard in Fenden for a period of time. I can think of no one better to appoint than Kel Pentelin here. It's an easy job. It's mostly just keeping some riffraff in line. You shouldn't have to draw your sword. Uh, it'll be, actually, it'll probably be worse than what you've dealt with. It'll probably be lots of paperwork and bureaucracy and standing in lines, but at least you'll have a warm house, uh, good food and staff to help you with all your problems. And you'll only be 15 miles from the capital and your family. Um, but if you could stand some administration and bureaucracy and a little bit of, you know, keeping the peace, uh, that that's going to be your next appointment. That sounds wonderful, Richard. I'm sure I will be able to do that. Um, can I hand it one last request, maybe? Please. Uh, at this point in time, you could ask just about anything of me, and I wouldn't refuse. I'll squint at him for a second. Is he trying to flirt with me? No, he wouldn't dare, would he? No, he's already... <laughs> no. no! It's just a bit... All right, Elaine is very bad at reading emotions. Sometimes so she's like, what's that? She's like, you know? Like, what Elaine's it? never like, been no. flirted with before, and so she has no idea, because you're she's the, the like, bastard no. half-elf, and so this is a... Yes, yes. She's like, no, right? No. no. Okay, never mind. And she's like... I mean, he is so handsome. No. No. Okay, so... Next time... Next time there's this really important mission and somebody gets a cleric to scry on that place, I would very much appreciate it if I could be in the room. Oh, tell me about it. You know, you're gonna get you're gonna get a plate full of administration and bureaucracy and the slow moving gears of government where something happens and then you don't find out about it until weeks or months later and when you want to check up on it uh it's just i hear you i hear you elaine this, this mission could have been outfitted better you could have had better access to information but the logistics of making an empire function are painful, brutally painful. So the next time when I'm going on a mission <laughs> where it is crucial that I'm in the room when there is scrying going on because I'm supposed to lead 30 people who are barely adult age who've been pulled from their farms and places to defend our empire. I would very much like to be in the room when that takes place. I will absolutely do everything in my power to make that happen. I don't know That's how clerical magic merchant. works beyond me. No. I'm just a simple merchant who has gotten very I'm lucky very in life. I'm very grateful for your future efforts to involve <laughs> me in such decisions, I'll say. I see. Is there anything else I can do for you? Um. No, not right now, actually. I, I might need a servant to send out some letters, like some errand boy. I have a few things to do. I also need to find a certain person um, and do some more questioning, but it's nothing, nothing big, nothing really important. So maybe just a messenger boy that can help me out for for a little while before I move on. Otherwise, I, um... I shall get a scribe and a runner to help you with whatever you need. Um, and I expect you will be personally rewarded by the Empire. Um, there's a promotion in coming down the pipeline for you. But as a, a personal token of thanks, um, I would like to like to give you a gift um, and he will turn to the side on the like the nice cushy couch that he's sitting in there's like a, a box next to him that he's been like placing his drink on and he'll move the drink to another table and open the box and rummage around in and pull out like you know a soft velvet bag about you know about the size of your a fist and uh, he will place it on the table before you uh, and say this uh this i had made for you in anticipation of your success um 
I have deep pockets, and um, just consider this a, a personal reward for a job well done. Lord Richard, you really didn't need to do such a thing. I'm really just out there trying to do my job, I'll say. Of course. I assume it would be very impolite to decline such a gift anyway, so I'm going to politely un unwrap whatever is in that in that small bag. Mm -hmm. um, in the small bag is a um, there is a one of the, what like a the medallions that you wear that like open up on the inside. Mm -hmm. uh, what's mm -hmm. what's the term for that? Locket. Yeah. Locket the term. It yeah, is, look, it works. It's a locket, and on the outside, it's like silver with the um, Pentelin family crest on it with some sort of like jade stone in the middle with like a, an onyx or a piece of obsidian. You're not a gemist. You don't you don't know what these things are, <laughs> uh, but a piece right. of a like, black gemstone carved in the shape of your, your family sigil uh, inlaid in the jade on top of the, the silver you know, with the pressed edges on like a, a nice silver chain, um, and it will open up on the inside, um, and it'll just have like a little place to to put something. And sitting in where you would like either put like a little drawing or a little token that you want to hold on to or whatever, uh, sitting inside there is like, you know, the small like a, a small block of mithril that has been like pounded down to just barely fit inside of here, which is. Um, you know, super expensive and can be turned into a ring or could be turned into whatever you want. Um, but it's a, a large cash prize within a locket of your family. Wow. I don't think I've ever seen Mithril up close, have I? No, it's super rare. Um, fine resource, very light, very strong, stronger than iron uh, and like a quarter of the weight of it. So... Um, it's also hard to get worked. It's hard not you can't just have any old merchant or any old blacksmith work on it. And as you he see as you open it and you get see the mithril and he sees, you know, your eyes looking at it, he will tell you that if you ever need it forged into a ring or into something, um, contact me. I, I have a excellent smith who can work on it. You can also sell it, keep it. It's your gift. Do do with it as you please. I will not be offended, whatever your actions. I think Elaine is a little bit surprised because first of all, this is this is more than just I'll give you a gift as a military person, right? If you want to flatter like a general, an officer, or whatever, you would just give them a really nice dagger or something. Be like, mm. yeah, you know, you can have another weapon. But a locket is a very personal item, right? And it has mm -hmm. a family sigil on it as well which very much flatters Elaine's I'm trying to do a lot for my family and trying to further them. So I guess he really read her really well in that regard, which is not hard to do, but... Um, so she'll gently touch him with a look at him and she, you know, thinks about her words because first she's all, well, you shouldn't have done that and that's very expensive and I don't know. And But, you know, Elaine does have a position. She's trying to further herself. So she'll say... Um, Richard, this is a very kind and very delicate gift. Um, I think it shall forebode uh, a great connection and the great things we will be able to do in our future. I appreciate this very much. This is very kind of you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for all your service. Please take some time to rest. Fenden is waiting for you when you're ready. Um, I see that the non-commissioned officer Willa is here with you. Um, is she yes. someone you would like to keep in your employ? I'll say um, Willa is a very capable officer. I would like to keep her in my employ, but I will leave it up to her whether she wants to join me in my future efforts or whether she would rather go back to the army to do her duty. She's a very... Um, soldier-minded person i would understand if she would rather put her efforts with the army itself than with my more personal quests richard, look over at willa. richard looks at willa you look at willa willa is uh 
caught in a little bit of frustration because now all of a sudden she has to make a choice for herself instead of just following these orders. And the last time the people from Outlast made a choice for themselves, it went down really poorly and they've been, you know, damned in history for it for hundreds and hundreds of years. And uh, so what does she, I mean, if she says that she doesn't want to fight with the rest of the army, that's clearly shame on her family and her line and her people. On the other hand, she's actually being given a choice to do what she wants. And so maybe she should say what she wants, but like, shouldn't she just, you know, try to reclaim the honor for her people out there. And um, she will just be, uh, and she's got like six charisma and she's got like five willpower. And so there's like, a, uh, there, there's uh, some stammering and some, uh, 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 I, I, I serve the empire of Drakus, however it is best served. Kel Pentelin, if you think I could serve the empire well under your command i would continue to do so but if you think i would be of better service elsewhere i i will go as you direct me um uh, as i am told <clears throat> i say that's i understand your concerns Willa. um you will come with me then and whenever we think it is best for you to rejoin the efforts of the army then we will have you go back there. Th thank you, Kel Pentelin and Lord Richard Marshall of Excellent. Uh of Drekus. And at that point I'll reach over like under the table and I'll quickly squeeze her hand tight enough so she stops talking. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, she'll shut up. <laughs> and we're gonna take our last break and we'll come back for a very short fourth section. So see you on the other side of a break. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Rise of Drekus, Chapter 1, last session. So, Elaine, we're going to skip time. We're going to skip... Oh... When did we start this campaign? We started in May 2nd, and now you leave the island like May 3rd, or I'm sorry, May, June. So you left in around midsummer. Um, so we're gonna skip like six months. We're gonna skip six months or so. Um, in this time, you have been promoted. You are now officially, where were you before? Uh, you're gonna gain a level. Let me find my notes on how we structure our society over here. Military structure. Um, yeah, so before you were a leader or like, you know, junior lieutenants now, you'll be a full-fledged proper lieutenant. Uh, I think a captain in the system is usually fifth level. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. I would like to put in a request. That I level up at least because it's been a rough yeah. time. We're going to level. We're going to level right now. We're going to roll some HP. We're going to assign all the oh things. Boy. Oh, Jesus. And then okay. we're going to have a conversation or two or three. Okay. How many levels am I gaining? We're gaining one level. All right. So um, 1d10 plus Wait, before you roll the nothing. d10, we have to... Do you have high con? Sorry. We have to... <laughs> No, I don't. Do we need the... Oh, yes, I do. Hold up. Yes, I do. What am I talking about? That's what I about? thought. That's what Hell I thought. Hell yeah. Hell where, yeah. Okay. Where is our... Ah, Plus here, two. here it is. There we go. This is our... Our fun... It plays... Perfect. All right, Elaine. Downtime. You've been in Fenden. We'll talk about it in a bit. Why don't you roll us mm. D10 plus two, is it? For mm. HP? Yes. So yeah. your 31 <laughs> HP becomes 42. Let's go. Pull up there. We're going back. I want that pallet, Neil. I'm ready. <laughs> oh my God. All right. Uh, and that brings All you to right. level four. So you get another plus one to hit from level. Uh, your saving throws are going to remain the same. And let's take a look at proficiencies. I don't know if you Can gain any. I put my any... armor back on. I assume I get my plate back. Yes, you get your plate. So I'm back at 20? Yep. 20, 17? Yep. Amazing. Um, nope, you already got all your weapon and non-weapon at 3. So at this level, it's literally just HP and a plus 1 to hit. 
Um, excellent. You deleted my armor of my combat section, you know, road. I just changed it from chain chest to, or plate chest to chain chest. Well, you there you change go. It, you changed it's it back. I changed it back. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. <sighs> it's fine. All right. All right. It's fine. Excellent. Look at those nine HP. That makes me happy for the rest of the weekend. Mm hmm. That's a good roll. So glad. It's a yes, good roll. We will need roll. that coming going forward. We will need that HP, people. Mm -hmm. Um. <clears throat> so, Fenden. It's got some problems. It's got some crime. It's not the worst position you've ever been in. You've got, you know, the local town guard to manage. Normally, a knight like you wouldn't be in charge. Of, like, it would be a local person, maybe a local knight, maybe just a local um, appointed sheriff or something. The city watch is different than, like, the sheriff and the police. The city watch watches the walls. The sheriff deals with, like, law enforcement. Slightly different positions here. You're in charge of the city watch, and so you're more of, like, making sure people coming in and out on the roads aren't smuggling in goods. Um, and all that sort of jazz. Why Maybe. do I have the feeling that I... Why did I get that position, you think? Someone needed to I, do it, and... Um, and you, I was around anyway, so I was like, oh, whatever. Well, you, you got a job, and someone needed... As far as you know, that's it. It's just... Mm. They, they needed to do something with you. You needed a position. This was and a available like anybody position. wanted to have like a look, you know, like a closer look at me and make sure I didn't do anything fancy for like the next few months, you know, just making sure I'd, nothing that, had happened to me. You were given a, you were given a downtime. Yeah, nothing happened in that downtime. And they clearly brought back the cleric and interrogated her in the capital. And, you know, when your when your rest and relaxation period was done, um, you got to go to Fenden and um, I'm going to say that nothing too exciting happened there, but I will let you make up, you know, what what was the most exciting thing that happened to you in Fenden? And you, it oh could be God. something actually exciting, or the most exciting thing could be like completely boring and mundane, whatever you want. Um, but tell me the the most interesting thing that happened to Elaine or that Elaine are was in charge of. In, are there only nobles in Fenden as well? Oh, there are tons of nobles, yeah. Um, let me think. I think the most exciting thing for Elaine was that she actually arrested one of the nobles in Fenden for being in league with the Varasi clerics and that weird cult. I think um, that somebody spilled the beans, uh, they figured it out, and she arrested that person and threw them into prison. Oh. Um, so she's taken a fair step into the right direction, working together with Richard to make this a better place. Excellent. Excellent. <clears throat> Um, other things that happened in your downtime before we get to what we're really here to talk about is uh, you got to go back and visit with your family a little bit. I imagine that's something that Elaine would want to do. You don't have to, but I imagine you would at least swing by to say hi to mom and dad and all the, the siblings, right? Maybe? Yeah, and yeah, absolutely. And I think um, being away for that long time and being aware of all those people who never get to go back to their families makes you appreciate your family no matter how weird <laughs> and cruel they can be sometimes like elaine had a real feeling of homesickness and mm. missing her people and she wanted nothing more than just sit back on that long table with her dad on like one side and just while everybody else was making polite conversation him not saying a word just you know being there she doesn't need to yeah i mean she will talk about her adventures and her stories especially when her little brother asks and all these things but mm -hmm. um she just wants to be back there and even if she's not the center of attention and even if she's not um the most important person and if other people are more important in her family she just wants to be back and feel a part of it again even if not everything is always rainbow and sunshine i think she genuinely misses just being home and being aware of what it is all she's fighting for all the time. Yeah, well, you're definitely going to be getting a, what do we call it? Um, a nice big feast when you return home. Uh, word of your accomplishments will reach your home well before you do. And as you are brought in <clears throat> um, and given a feast and given, you know, a talking to and uh, lots of tell us your stories, hugs and appropriate affection that your sort of cold noble family would give, but not too much. 
Um, your younger siblings, Adeline and Adeline, uh, swarm near your knees and ankles to, well, I guess they're 16 and 14. They're not, they're not that small, um, but they will come by to hear all the mm-hmm. stories about what's been going on. <clears throat> um, Adelwyn, the, the younger brother of yours, the towering six foot seven, 256 <laughs> pound, 16 year old. He is huge age. He's so tall. He's mm-hmm. so tall. Oh my goodness. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, he's been, he's taken to sort of like philosophy as uh, one of his primary interests. And uh, in the the past, one of the great McGarry brothers that that ended the war in Arcadia, that slew this evil (laughs) red dragon, Scoria, was a cleric of Velthara, the goddess of vengeance. Um, And Adelwyn, you know, this philosopher now, has been reflecting on what it means that the kingdom was governed for not governed, but like led by a cleric in some ways of vengeance and how that might not be the right path forward. How, if we really want to be um, in line with the world, we need more justice and less vengeance. And I think, you know, the, the, the McGarry brother by the name of Anton, who, who worshiped the goddess of vengeance, you know, he disappeared at the end of the war and um, he just vanished. And I think that's vengeance taking its toll on him. And I think that's uh, either Velthara or Velmontarius, the cousins, brothers, siblings, the siblings, one goddess of vengeance, one is god of justice. Um, it's them working together to, you know, end the cycle of violence and hatred. And um, you, sister, going and dealing with these deserters is a matter of justice. And I think you know, Velmontarius, the god, would be proud of what you did on that island. Um, and the, the younger giant kid with the, you know, strong sense of philosophy, but absolutely <laughs> not enough education in the subject to really know what he's talking about, gives you his, like, deep take on, like, why the god of justice would love everything you did, um, even though he has no idea what happened. I think I will just be, I'll be sitting there and uh, listen to him going on and on and just sometimes politely interrupt and correct one or two things where I'm trying to make it very clear that during wartime, sometimes we can't reach the highest standard that we set for ourselves and sometimes we have to go for what is right instead of what is good, you know, and that if you believe like that vengeance does have its place in our world but if we can strive for justice then you know that that is a good thing to do and that means you know that we have capacities of everything Mm -hmm. and i'm i like listen to him go on and on and on and i'm going to um raise up my uh my wine glass towards uh my aunt uh lady ella i believe it is who's Mm. probably also here and you know toast towards her while my my brother is just chewing on my ear just telling me stuff you know i'd be like yes i'm just i'm like yes yes okay very good mm-hmm. and i'll like toast toast towards her and i'll see if she um is willing to toast back because my aunt is a very driven person who very much likes to better her stand in society and whenever she thinks you have achieved something she will recognize that but when oh, absolutely she, you don't she will anything, she'll give you a toast you. and she'll ask like Elaine, where did you get that magnificent amulet? Mm, do you like? Would you like to see it up close? I'll take off the amulet and I'll like hand it over to her. So yeah, she can have a closer she'll look. take it. She'll realize it's a locket and opens it. Did you leave the mithril in there, or is it in your the pocket? The mithril is still no. The mithril is still in there. I explicitly left it in just in mm. case my aunt would ask. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it, you know, she opens it and it plops out until she catches it in her mm-hmm. hand. She'll look at this and turn it over and look at you and be like, "My Elaine, where did you get this? Surely you didn't have the money to make it yourself. You don't have this sort of taste. Where'd this come from?" <laughs> I just swallow those, you know, backhanded compliments where she's like, "You don't have this." I'm like, "Oh my god!" And I'm like, um, "Oh, I actually got it from uh, Lord Marshall. We had a very nice conversation, and he's very much appreciated my service." And going forward. Well, we've decided to work very closely together. Maybe at some point I can introduce you, you know. I'm sure he's going to have the soiree at his uh, summer house at some point. You could tag along if you felt up for it. Why, of course. Uh, you know, high society is a very demanding place, and a woman of your 
um, talents could certainly use a little bit of ushering through the the very different sort of bloody chaos that can be a soiree. Now, in these situations, Elaine, it's not so much how you can balance yourself on your feet and swing your sword. It's not about, you know, it's, it's about piercing through your enemy's defenses in a completely different way. And I think your, your combat training, while clearly superior to a many others um might need a little bit of augmentation on the the social side of things well i don't know what i would do without your support sweet aunt i'm sure we will figure something out together i'm very happy to have you by my side for these occasions well that's why they named you after me isn't it I'm sure it is, I'll say. <laughs> so tell me, and she'll, you know, lean in and sit close to you for during this dinner and, you know, tell me all about Lord Marshall. Um, what, what mm. I've heard he's a, you know, a powerful and handsome businessman. Is it, are the other things true? <clears throat> I've never had the pleasure of meeting with him directly. I've seen him at parties from a distance, of course, and said hello, but uh, never more than a simple, uh, and you know, we don't have to go too yeah. deep into it, but there's a, yeah. a conversation to be had here. Yes, there is a conversation happening as well. As well. Mm. Okay. Well, we're <laughs> going to skip ahead a little bit more then. Um, and this will be, oh, about seven, you know, a month month after you're done in Fenden. Mm -hmm. um, you've already been told that you have another thing coming up. That you should get a little mm -hmm. bit of rest and you go back and hang out with your family or whatnot for that little bit of rest. Um, and then you are summoned to the capital city, to Wickthron Rorenta itself. Uh, and you are brought inside the castle and oh positioned boy. in a hallway outside of a meeting room, um, inside of which there are, you know, many important people. Uh, as you're sitting Plenty in the hallway. Plenty of people waiting. As far as I've heard, whenever you're trying to get any appointment in the castle, it takes up for two, up to two days for anybody to come and see you. And apparently, you know, mm -hmm. it takes a really long time to meet people there. Uh, you know, without cell phones, everyone just has to agree to be at a place at a time. And without clocks and watches that are like, keep synchronized time across everywhere, you just... Everyone's kind of judged by where the sun is in the sky. And then when someone mm. doesn't show up or a horse throws a shoe and someone's delayed by a day, it throws everything. It's just, it's a mess. It's really hard to get anything done. And everything happens much, much more slowly um, in the olden days where we're dealing with right now. Um, yeah, but you'll be brought into the castle proper. And there's a meeting room outside of which you are sitting and being the good soldier and good knight that you are. Is this even the right track hold? That sounds way too... That sounds very dangerous. Is the assassin coming in? This is not the <laughs> right like, vibe. Are you going to kill me, Neil? I'm not ready This is not the right vibe. Hold on. We have to change this. <clears throat> uh, um, Neil, is is the golden dragon in Rick or is she somewhere else at that point when I come through the city? You do not see her in the sky. You have not seen her in the skies above the capital. You have not seen her in the skies above Fenden. You have not mm -hmm. seen the gold dragon since arriving. Okay. Um, but you'll be in the hallway waiting, because like a good knight, you showed up ahead of the appointment time, and all the bureaucrats are running late, like they do. Uh, and so you're, you can sit in this hallway as person after person comes and gets shuffled into this room. Mm -mm. You will uh, have to stand for attention when the queen and her bodyguards come walking by. They don't pay you any attention, you know, uh, and they, they shuffle into the room. Um, you'll see officers of various ranks and various uh, positions. You'll see some scribes and some squire, not squires, uh, scribes and some scholars. Some of them will come in and some of them will go out. Um, your grandmother, Lady Cora Pentelin, uh, <clears throat> General of the Armies in the East, will show up, um, and she'll stop and give you, like, a polite, Elaine, it's so nice to see you. We'll chat later, uh, and then come on in. You will see some wizards and some clerics, uh, like, a wizard and their apprentice, and a cleric and their apprentice. Um, the wizard does look to be the sole surviving McGarry brother. Um, <clears throat> and he's got this like dark and foreboding countenance on his face. Like he's seen 
a lot of uh, things. Um, and he's tired. He's got this this like burden of weight on his shoulders. Can you make me a charisma check? Oh boy, it's happening. Yes, I'm making a charisma check. Um, Don't worry 18. about it. Eighteen. It's fine. It's totally fine. He'll head on I'm into not the worried. room. He look. He just looks like a very stressed man. <laughs> he looks like a very stressed wizard who's got like an assistant with him. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and Lord Marshall will come on into the room as well. And I'll stop and, and make a very polite like, oh, hello, Lane. I'm sorry. I'm running late to this meeting, but it's good to see you. We'll, we'll chat in a bit. We're, we're actually going to be talking a bit about um, what we need you for. So uh, just, just wait right here. And yes. as you're waiting, servants will come in and out of the room. The door is mostly shut, but every now and then, you know, uh, someone will be at the door and hold it open for a while. And every now and then, because this doesn't appear to be like an ultra top secret, no one can know. I mean, it's definitely a closed meeting inside the castle, which is a protected area. But every now and then, the door will be not closed all the way. Left, left open a crack. And you can hear the conversation happening inside. Um, all these important people are having a discussion about the the future of Eridon, not Eridon, of Drekus, the future of the Empire. Um, and the following things are getting discussed. The monarch of Eridon needs to reclaim the rest of Eridon. Um, and they don't have the, the people to do it. Right, the Eridonians themselves are scattered to the winds and only recently sort of coming together. You can hear this conversation about how Drekus will happily loan soldiers and wizards and clerics and you know the resources to Eridon so that Eridon might reintegrate um, its former empire um, under you know themselves, their, their former kingdom. And as a, a subsidiary of the Empire of Drekus, you know, that, that will bring more people into Drekus, but it's not going to be Drekus attacking or, you know, um, consuming Hillsborough and Clydesdale and Redport and Rockwave. It's Eridon who's reclaiming their territory, and we're just going to lend them some soldiers because that belongs to the kingdom of Eridon, and we should, you know, promote the stability of the world and of our continent so we can loan them some soldiers. And, you know, the door will shut, and you'll miss the rest of that conversation. And another part you'll hear is that there is um, Gate Isle in the north. Um... A, a small expedition was spent, just a, a couple of officers to go see what was going on over there because it's been sort of communications have been lost and there's been some weird happenings coming out of Weatherlight and those people didn't come back. Uh, and so, you know, boats sink, shit happens. You send two emissaries and they don't show up and like, now you got to send more emissaries to figure out what happened to those emissaries, but it's not that big of a deal. And those ones have recently come back and it turns out that Gate Isle is like, you know, crawling with undead throughout the woods. Um, and they're not out in the plains because you're hearing something about, you know, um, this, this miracle that happened and the undead are now outright destroyed by sunlight you know they catch fire and burn in the light of sun um and so the undead can no longer you know swarm over open areas but the deep dark forest of gade isle is still haunted the blumwood the summerwood um the direwood are all still infested with these undead that are probably remnants of the Mistrian um, necromancer who was raising multiple undead armies all over the place. Like he was making, raising a, an undead army in Mistria and one in Eridon. And this must be the third one that he was raising out in Gate Isle and having to find the appropriate people to go deal with that. Um, someone offers it to this, this wizard, uh, and he shakes his head and says, like, you know, this is below my pay grade. What do you want me to do? Burn an entire forest to the ground? If you want, I can burn the entire forest, but you don't want the entire forest destroyed. Those are resources. You know, get a cleric. Get a, get a person of God to handle the undead. It's not the domain. It's not my domain. I, th I think Elaine is just uh, sitting outside, just slightly nodding, just thinking, yeah, just get a cleric, but don't get me. I'm not going into any forest slaying mm -hmm. skeletons. Like, please, just give it to some godly person. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, there's talk of the small kingdom of Matava, which has also had to join in with the empire of Drekus, and um, how they are not necessarily upholding their end of the negotiations and bargains, and um, they are frustrating attempts at integration and the, you know, disillusion, or not disillusion, the dissolvement of their former societal problems, um, and that there are there are dip diplomatic needs that need to be addressed there. There's a conversation that you hear bits of about the nor the dwarves in the north of Eridon and the Hemdercos Hills and how they wish to form their own empire or their own kingdom of dwarves. Uh, dwarven kingdom for dwarves by dwarves in dwarven lands um, underground. And uh, just a really quick chit chat about like, well, what are we going to do about this? This is former Eridon. And very quickly, the... Um, the wizard's assistant speaks up and says, you know, like, Warven tunnels are small. They're almost impossible to root out. You would never be able to conquer them. You might be able to kill them all, but there's no point in conquering. Um, they are also terrible sailors and bordered on all sides by the kingdom of Eridon. So let's play the long game. Be nice. Play nice. And soon the economic advantages of being integrated with the Empire will outweigh the desires for being outside. And that when that day comes, they can become a special territory with more self-governance, but, you know, pays the appropriate taxes up the hill and will apply the appropriate soldiers and levy the appropriate forces. And there's a general assessment that, like, yes, let's not go to war with the dwarves and have to, like, put tall humans in tiny tunnels that are guarded with like deep spears and axes uh, that sounds like a terrible idea let's not let's not do that um, and there's a conversation about the elven woods that you hear the elves abandoned their ancestral homeland that they've lived in since the dawn of time this is the first land that's ever been created Arcadia is the, the very first continent the very first landmass and the elves that lived in Feywool and in the Kingdom of Silvis, as the humans called it, are gone. And their woods are left. And what's going on there? And this is where you find that all of those trackers that you wanted, they've all been redeployed into the elven lands to figure out what's happening there and sorting through the woods and the mystical traps that have been left behind and the strange creatures. And while the elves have left and so have many of the other fey folk, there are still, you know, pockets of fairies and nymphs and brownies and pixies and leprechauns that did not leave and are resisting in their own frustrating indirect ways the encroachment of humanity people will like wake up and they'll be in a completely different part of the woods and all of their gear is gone and then they like stumble home somehow having lost everything and not knowing what happened to them and there's all sorts of like weird mystical shit going down and that's why all the like great trackers of the land are up there i think um, outside elaine just very sharply draws in a deep breath because she does not have the best relationship with elves naturally. <laughs> yeah. And she just can't believe that. The reason why she had to go on that island without a tracker or any capable person was because they've been hunting pixies in some magical mushroom forest. Like she's trying you know, she's trying to keep her cool, but she is just sitting outside thinking, All right. I mean, I hope yeah. it's worth it. I hope it's worth it. Because well, damn. We finally get to the meat of our story here. Um, and the next step for the Empire, now that the Empire has dealt with all of the models of internal security, you know, the, the remaining Verasi born again clerics are, are being dealt with and rounded up, and the remaining nobles are being caught, and it, it's being sorted. And the next step is to regain territories that used to be part of Drakus or Eridon. Um, and, and bring them back into the fold. Uh, and there's three specific lands that are being talked about. There's um, Minotauria, island off the coast of Drekus, run by Minotaurs, um, and how that once upon a time had an alliance with Drekus, and we need to send an appropriate person to Minotauria to uh, manage that relationship. 
There's the issue of Gnome, the Gnomish nation of mighty engineers, which is technically Drakissian Kingdom. Many, many years ago, maybe decades, centuries ago, who can remember at this point, uh, Drekus showed up and conquered Gnome by just showing up and saying, you have to pay us taxes now. And the Gnome sort of fell in line. Uh, but it turned out that adm administering the area was unpleasant and complicated. <laughs> and there was a dragon who lived there and it wasn't really worth it. And it became very expensive to manage the Gnomish nation because no one wanted the duty of going to Gnome to extract taxes. And no one wanted the duty of having to enforce laws in Gnome. And everyone who went on those missions demanded like, you know, triple or quadruple pay. And after a period of time, missions to Gnome to collect taxes just stopped. And it's technically still part of Drakissian territory, and they owe maybe like a century worth of back taxes. Um, but no one wants that. But now the dragon so what I'm hearing, on Gnome what is I'm dead. Hearing, Neil, is if I go to Gnome and I've managed to get them to pay taxes, I could make it really big in that kingdom, yeah? You could make it big if you went to Gnome to administer the government of Drekus there. And without the dragon, a lot of the reason for not bothering with Gnome is, is sort of gone. Um, and it's agreed that a person should be sent. And you hear a bunch of names being passed around. Your name is one of them, but they don't settle on you for that job. You are, you're swept aside. Damn. Should have volunteered. <laughs> the last thing that they're talking about is this outpost um, on the new island of Ethos. And this one, there's a lot of chiming in on. The, the wizard and the cleric both talk about it. The cleric talks mm -hmm. at length about this. The wizard's assistant talks at length about this. This island to the northeast of Arcadia is known as Ethos, and it is the first new land to be created by the gods in 2,000 years? Something like that. No one really knows. Maybe something on the far side of the world has been done, but at least in this part of the world, the gods stopped making new land masses many thousands of years ago. Um, and the last time they reshaped any land masses was 1500 years ago. But they've recently begun to create a new island called Ethos. And no one knows why or how. And none of the clerics that have been asking questions have been able to get answers. And maybe a half decade ago, a little more, Drekus sent some people some soldiers and some civilians and some merchants and some surveyors and they set up a little town a little town called santa barbara on the coast of ethos and during the war contact was lost no one really knows why it could just be because mystery and ships that were going there were sinking and eventually you just stop sending boats because like your boats are busy doing other things um it could be that you know, something bad has happened there. One of the leading theories is that Mistrian forces have, like, the, the survivors of the Mistrian army that didn't want to surrender hopped on a boat and fled north and took over Ethos, and now they're living there. And so there might be a large or a small group of Mistrians in Ethos that has kind of taken over the area. It's possible that the locals just said, hey, we're a colony and we don't want to be a colony anymore, so we're going to be our own people. But that seems very unlikely because, like, what what is a colony going to do? Rebel against the greatest empire that the world's ever seen? Like, come on now. Colonies don't can't do ridiculous. that shit. Don't be ridiculous. Don't be ridiculous. It's never going to happen. You're just going to get reconquered when the empire shows back up. Um, and they need someone to go, you know, sort this out. And that's when you can hear Richard Marshall's voice saying, well... Lieutenant Pentelin did extremely well in the Southern Isles uh, on Arrow Island. I could think of no finer soldier to investigate the happenings in Ethos. Are there any objections? Does anyone have a better person in mind? Eh, and someone will mention like, well, isn't that a little bit of a, big of a job for, you know, a, a junior officer? She's, you can hear the shuffling of paperwork. She's got a good record and comes from a good family, but isn't she a little green and a little young for something like this? 
Um, you hear some other names being tossed around. The apparently the the Prince Van Helsing, who was married to the Empress's daughter, is missing, um, and they're considering using you on a mission to go find Van Helsing and you know bring him back home because he's gone. He was sent east to to do a thing and, and just never came back from it and. He's clearly alive somewhere, but maybe maybe we should send Elaine to go do this. Um, in the end, there's sort of like a, well, she led an expedition before. She can do it again. It's a difficult job, but why not? And you can hear Richard saying, well, she's made some specific requests for, for better resources. Perhaps, um, She's sitting outside, and there's some other people in the hallway, too. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe we can bring her in and talk to her directly about it. And uh, the door will open all the way, and someone will come on over and weave you into this room, this big Ooh. table with maybe two dozen people uh, around it and some people standing, including the Empress <laughs> herself. And you can see her like wow. ninth-level bodyguards in full plate with magic swords and probably magic armor who are standing at direct attention and whose eyes, like track you across the room as you walk in with your oh. armor and sword but probably not your shield and you can mm -hmm. you can just feel that if you tried any shit that you would be dead so fast in this room that these like you know queen's guard empress's bodyguards are ready to murder you the moment you look at her the wrong way like you can just feel their eyes behind their visors watching you I think my mind just goes entirely blank in that moment. You know, like you're not supposed to look at anybody funny. You don't want to make any mistakes. So I will just uh, take a quick, uh, quick knee in front of the in front of the queen, mm -hmm. and I'll say, uh, "My empress, it's an it's an honor. Thank you for inviting me here today." Lieutenant Pentolin, I hear you've done quite a good job. I thank you for. Your service with the fallen cleric, Mother Ilse. I hear she has said many terrible things about me, self, and the people in this room. I'll what take a quick... I'll take a quick glance around at the people in the room. Like, all right. It's your grandmother, the guy who was employing you and gave you some really nice shit. It's the empress. It's like the king of the nearby kingdom who's also like decked out of magic gear. It's his weird assistant who is definitely a foreigner and who you don't recognize, but like gives you kind of the heebie-jeebies and a high-powered cleric over here and just a bunch of other, you know, this is the, this is the room where the empire gets made. Um, and the Empress says, look about. What do you see? I'll say, um, well, if there's one thing that I have learned from my family, then it is that um, great people inspire great awe and also great jealousy. If it wasn't that way, they wouldn't be great people. Mm. You have served your empire well. Are you ready to serve again? I am, and I will always be ready to do whatever task is put in front of me. Are you familiar with the island of Ethos? Should I do like do a quick? How does it work? Do I do a quick geography check? Am I familiar? I mean, I've heard the story outside, and I will just say, um, well, I've heard that is it is newly acquired land, and I've heard that there's some issue making sure it stays acquired land. Hmm. We need a good trustworthy, loyal servant of the Empire who is familiar with 
overseas deployments away from ready supplies and reinforcements to bring this lost colony back into the fold and to find out what has gone wrong. Lord Marshall speaks very highly of your previous deeds. He says that you would be a perfect person to handle this situation, that you could regain contact with the outpost, secure the region from threats, and gather intelligence on what has been happening in the area, including taking any valuable prisoners. It is a difficult job, and one that is probably above your station, your pay, and your capabilities. But if you are All anything right. like your grandmother, I think you will surprise us. You do not have to accept this position. It is being offered to you. You may turn it down without shame, regret, or fear of mm, losing status or station. Will I be able to have a say in the choice of people who accompany me in that mission? There's a um, pause, and the Empress looks to Lord Marshall, and he says, uh, <clears throat> within limitations, of course, but yes, we can assign, you can, you can have a voice in the outfitting. then I will gladly accept that challenge that you've placed on my shoulders. And even though it might be above my status and my experience, I will sure to carry out my duty as well as I possibly can. I will not disappoint. Good. Good. <clears throat> um... Everyone sort of looks at you for a little while. Lord Richard Marshall will pipe up. Um, are there any specific requests that you have now? No? Then I, I will ask, see you. Can I ask what what did you do with the cleric after I returned her? one of these other people whose names you're not familiar with. Um, it's an older woman. You know, she's got to be in her 70s or something. Not a cleric, not a wizard. Um, but she wears these... She wears the... a similar sort of garb to the, the city executioner. Um, she's not. You know who the executioner is. Like, that's like a, a pretty prominent and famous role it's also like you know not a person that you ever want to talk to or touch or be near they're sort of like a you know it's a, a, a it's an unpleasant position but everyone's I familiar with why. who the executioner is <laughs> yep, um, right. but she's dressed similar to the <clears throat> executioner but you don't actually know who she is <clears throat> she's very old and she will speak up and say mother ilsa remains under the castle or future questioning if the time and the need arises. It is not wise to put to death clerics, but she is not someone who can be forgiven or let go. She may spend the rest of her days imprisoned or she may yet find a way to salvage her soul. I think I'm a little surprised <laughs> at these words that there might be a way for her to salvage her soul. I say, um, yeah, I understand that that's the reason why I brought her back alive. Um, we thank you for returning her alive. And I believe I can speak on behalf of this room when I appreciate your 
discretion with what you have seen and the words you have exchanged with the soldiers under your command regarding what they may have heard her espouse. You have shown tact and discretion. I think it would further this tact and discretion if we made sure that it is stressed that the goblin stompins had been betrayed themselves in whatever happened down on this island. I don't think it does us any good to have traitorous cows in our midst, if you understand what I mean. Um, Lord Marshal stands up. Uh, thank you, Elaine. I will speak with you shortly. Please, please wait outside. <clears throat> Excellent. Um, thank you. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll do a short bow, and I yeah. will quickly remove myself from this room that is way more powerful than any room I've ever been in. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The conversation in the room will continue for another hour or so, um, and then it'll disband. Some of the other people outside in the hall will go in and go out and blah, 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 blah. And eventually everyone will leave and you will be pulled into a separate room with, once again, Lord uh, Richard Marshall. Um, and he looks just as jolly and happy as the last time you saw him. He seems relaxed and in his element. Uh, and in this other smaller, less glorious little parlor room, he will sit down with you and say, so Elaine, to ethos you go we'll outfit a group um, part of our we will send with you one spellcaster of your choice wizard or cleric um, and we will make sure that you have an appropriate scout to go with you this time um and additionally you can decide um what you want we can send you with a ship that will be under your command the whole time um, and we can either outfit it with a large number of infantry. But that means, um, you know, the more mouths to feed, the fewer supplies there are available. And if there's a whatever happens, the, this this group, the, the, the more people we take with you, the, the more quickly you will have to act to regain contact with lost lands and lost peoples. Or you can take a, a smaller number of people that can be supplied by the ship for much longer. Um, how would you... Are you looking for overwhelming force or are you looking for a small, easily maneuverable um, tactical deployment? Um, just so I understand it correctly, these orders seem very relaxed in comparison to what I had to do before. So my goal is, like, I don't have to take this island by force, is that correct? The outpost needs to come home. We don't know <laughs> what's happening there. It might be a simple, peaceful, their port has been destroyed and our ships could never make it or something happened to them and there is no problem with the Empire whatsoever. Or maybe it's run overrun by mystery and forces, or maybe there's monsters who have killed everything and there's no more city left. Um, we, we don't know. The Well, I think if you give me some sort of spellcaster and, and a proper scout, then it is more reasonable to first figure out what exactly is going on that island before we deploy a full force there. So I think I will go with a smaller uh, deployment first. Try to establish some contact, try to figure out what's going on. You're familiar with um, Captain Yishun of the Wind Speed, right? Indeed I am! Uh, yes. Are you comfortable working with him again? I am sure we will work together just fine. Excellent. Uh, then we'll give you the Wind Speed and Yishun, who will be in charge of the ship but we'll answer to you uh you'll be able to move about the island or about the coast as you please um do watch out the uh, waters there are uncharted don't wreck the ship <clears throat> um we'll give you um small force so one spear two spears one one will last you twice as long two will last you half as long mm. 
let me think. I think we will go with two spears. Okay. Which and... is one smaller than we're right now. Yeah. And uh, for casters, you said wizard or cleric? Richard, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know much about clerics and I don't know much about wizards. I would very much like to have somebody who keeps me from bleeding through my cloak when I get attacked by a giant polar bear. So I will take anybody <laughs> who's knowledgeable, capable, and maybe knows anything about medicine. That would already be enough for me. Well, we have a spare cleric and a spare wizard on hand. Both are trained in healing and herbalism. And there are no polar bears. <laughs> anywhere near outpost santa barbara as far as we know in fact it there's no snow example, on Richard, the island it doesn't need to be a polar bear it was just an example just just to make sure your your fears are kept <clears throat> at bay but tell me cleric or wizard i'll think back to to the cleric i've encountered well, so far, none of the clerics have figured out why this island has come back. You mean been risen so, from the sea? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's quite a mystery. In fact, even our attempts to scry on the island have failed. Our finest advisors say it is because it is still being ripped uh, anew and created that the raw magics in play are making the whole area run wonky that's the technical term that i was told um, i think the cleric just failed to scry appropriately or the wizards failed their scrying and they're just saying oh no it's there's too much magic we can't look at it um to cover up their own failings but what do i know i'm not a spellcaster well, I have seen clerics speak to people, and I think if we want to go with a smaller group and convince people to come back to us, then another convincing voice would be a good idea. So if it was up to me, I would say, and she pauses and shudders a little bit and goes, well, I think another cleric then. If, I, if it was up to me. Well, we'll see. Um <clears throat> All right, two spears, a cleric, and we'll send a scout as well. Uh, and a ship. Sounds excellent. Do you have any individuals you would like to take? Um, Willa will be coming with me, of course. That was your um, um, non-commissioned officer from the last journey. My non-commissioned officer, correct. Um, and I have one very brave... Um, one very brave bowman that I would like to take as well. They fought valiantly in the last battle. Um, so I will commission them personally as well. And, um, I think that's everyone. Otherwise we will just fill them up with people who are ready and able. Hmm. Uh, he stands up and he reaches out a hand to shake yours. Uh, glad to have you on board, Lieutenant. I'll give him a firm handshake and I'll say, uh, it's my pleasure. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, with that, we are going to close out chapter one. And in two to three weeks, we will do Outpost, no, uh, Rise of Drekus chapter two, The Outpost on the Electric Frontier. Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> the Outpost Barbara on the Boogaloo. Frontier. The out Santa Boogaloo. Chapter two, Santa Boogaloo. Yeah, yes. Very good. yes. I'll think about it. <laughs> yes. Uh, and right. we have for our players, uh, Trump SC, Jeffrey, Jeff, the longtime player that we've had here. He did Light of a Loomis. He did a bunch of misclick stuff. He did Empires of Arcadia. Jeff has been around forever. Trump SC has been around forever. He's fantastic. And I think he will be playing our cleric or wizard um and we will also be having pichachu who we had as a guest on one of our our last episode of cosmos kitchen where they had to what was the there was 
I don't remember the primary plot line. All I remember is that she successfully lured small children in the woods. So, the, oh, they had to capture the tears of a heartbroken child, a heartbroken innocent. And so she had to uh, lead a child into the woods and break its heart. Um, so that, you know. That's a person mm -hmm. right up my alley. Yeah. Yay, and I think go. she's going to be playing our <laughs> scout. Um, <clears throat> so that's that. And uh, we'll see you then. Any final words, Kel Pantolin, before we go? Um, it's been a pleasure and it's been great fun playing Elaine for this uh, little chapter. Um, thank you for all the kind words, people. And once more, this is... This has been Nina's idea. Nobody's founded this campaign except for him personally. So if you like what Neil's doing, uh, go to his Patreon, become a Patreon. If you don't have any money, go to his YouTube, leave a like, leave a nice comment, because that's what enables him to do the stuff he loves, and that's what enables him to pull out, pull in people like me to play these these short little things. And I'm, uh, yeah, I'm truly grateful for that. So if you like it, try to support it as much as you can. Thank you, Faye. That was completely unnecessary, but I appreciate it. We'll <laughs> catch you all in the near future. Bye-bye. <laughs>